heard him say it myself. Pastor P, you're brand new to the channel. Happy to see you here. Take a quick second, introduce yourself. Uh, I don't know if you have any social media to shout out, but maybe tell people just a bit about you. Yeah, I don't have any social media to shout out. I, I believe I will. Um, I've been a pastor for 50 years uh, in ministry. I should say I, I've been in ministry for 50 years. 25 years of that was in as a pastor. And then the last 25 years has been as a missionary, uh, you might say, to the Jews. I, I'm, I'm actually a a liaison between the Jewish community and the Gentile church. I try to help Jews understand the gospel, uh, the, the, who the Messiah is and why he came. And then I try to help Gentile Christians to understand Jews so that they might reach out and love them. So I'm not a theologian per se, but uh, every day I get up and I study the word and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, but uh, sure. uh, I, I'm, I'm uh passionate about the word of God and I'm thrilled to be here. Now you had a, you had a show for a while. Is that right? Yes. I, uh, when I was in New York city, I was pastoring a church on Staten Island and uh, I got together 10 people who helped me produce a uh, television program. We did 180 television programs and it was right at the same time that Jerry Seinfeld was on television and I actually did more television shows than he did. And I won seven awards and uh, uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, but a claim you might say, and uh, success. Um, so we're thrilled that God blessed us in that way. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming in tonight. Uh, now we agreed backstage that you would have seven minutes for your opening statement before we move to seven minutes for Jay's. I'm going to start the timer now. Go ahead when you're ready. All right. Well, uh, as I started to say, uh, I've been a pastor for many years and been in ministry for many years, and uh, that is all fueled by my love for the Word of God. I was brought up in a in a, in church, had a string of perfect attendance pens, and joined the Bible Memory Association when I was eight years old, and uh, won lots of awards there for my Bible memory work, and uh, continued to memorize Scripture. And uh, by the time I was uh, finished with Bible college, I had memorized about 2,000 scriptures. And I uh, can't say that I can remember all of them now, so please don't ask me to quote you 2,000 scriptures. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I do have a son who's uh, kind of on the same journey. He's memorized uh, probably uh, one, about one-third of the New Testament and, and, and a good portion of uh, the Psalms and Genesis and so forth in the Old. So he's kind of following in my footsteps. So we are lovers of the Word of God. And the Word of God I have has been my anchor for all these many years. I became a, a true believer when I was uh, just about to turn 16 years old. And I started teaching a Bible study in my high school, preaching in the halls, evangelizing. We saw about 100 uh, of our fellow students t come to Christ during that year. That was my last year of high school. I went to college a year early and I did the same thing at my college. And we saw about a hundred people saved during that time as well. Uh, and then I went off to Bible college uh, and was there for four years. I was a dormitory supervisor teaching as well as teaching the Bible in the uh, dorm at, at night, every night. And then uh, pastoring as well uh, on the weekends. And uh, then I went to seminary for five years, and uh, then I went to seminary for another two, another seminary for another two years. So I'm overeducated, and I'm a gold brick. I know that, but uh, uh, maybe it'll, some of it'll come in handy tonight. But I wouldn't call myself a theologian. I call myself a Bible preacher. You know, George Whitfield. I was just down at a, a church that he helped to uh, pastor back down in St. Simon's Island, Georgia, and. Uh, he, his, his motto was, uh, put me in the middle of a field and I will set myself on fire with the gospel and the truth of the word of God and everybody will come and watch me burn. And I have preached uh, to hundreds of churches. I've preached uh, about 2,000 times on the street. I've been on television. I've taken every opportunity that I could take to preach the word of God. And I'm passionate about it. And it's in my heart. And I wanted to read you a passage of scripture. And I know you say, wait, 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 this is not solo scriptura. Yes, it is. <laughs> I'll get there. Just give me a second. So uh, this is from Psalm 19. 
David says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. He, the word of God is perfect, according to this psalm. It is sure, it is right, it is pure, it is true and righteous altogether. It is more to be desired than gold, sweeter than honey or the honeycomb. And if you keep it, there is great reward. I want to tell you today that the word of God is better than church councils, churches, etc. make mistakes. Christians make mistakes. The word of God is perfect. It, it's it's what it says right there. It's a perfect book, but we have an imperfect church. And I, I, I've been a, in the church my whole life. I, I was as involved in church as I could be as a child. And then uh, have been when we, I was in church every chance I could get my whole life. So I, I nobody under uh, believes in church more than I do. However, nobody knows the the corruption that can be in churches. I have watched my, my the first pastor that I was under uh, as a, as associate pastor when I was 18 years old committed adultery with our church uh, secretary, and I have seen that kind of thing happen time and again and again and again, and I've been in all kinds of churches. I've spoken in lots of venues. I know lots of priests. I, I've, I've, and I, I see that the church is, not all churches are terrible, but church is, churches are run by men and they are imperfect, whereas the scripture is perfect. And uh, it is powerful according to Romans, uh, according to Hebrews 4.12. It is preserved according to Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Uh, I believe that when the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1948, it was the same year that Israel became a nation. And I believe the two confirmed each other, that God had promised that his people would endure and that Israel would endure. They are his forever people, and Israel is, is, is a forever place for God. And here comes the word of God being found in a cave, cave number four, uh, near the Dead Sea. And a Bedouin boy found it and didn't realize, wow, we now know this is, it is almost exactly to the letter the same as the scroll of Isaiah that we already had. So it is preserved, it is protected. Uh, I, I do thank God for the early, some of the early councils, and maybe this is hypocritical of me, but the church gets it right sometimes, <laughs> and the Council of Carthage got it right when they said, these are the books, and these others are not the books. They threw out lots of books that, that could have been included in the Bible, but they said, no, these are not the books. But then you go to the Diet of Worms, when Worms, if you want to say, when Martin Luther was being indicted for her heresy, and they got it wrong. <laughs> they walked into the, on a Tuesday at 11 o'clock, they walked into the next room and said, we're gonna accept the Apocrypha as canonical, just so that we can say that there's purgatory. Uh, well, so, you know, some councils get it right and some councils get it wrong. Uh, I do thank God for the ones that got it right. I thank God for the Council of Nicaea, where, where Christ's deity was confirmed, and so forth. So some get it right and some get it wrong. And, and uh, you know, the church gets some things right. The church gets some things wrong. I believe that the uh, Word of God is inspired pre plenarily. In other words, it is uh, thoughts and words are, are inspired. Uh, and according to 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word, inspiration of God, is one big long word, theopneustos, inspired by, breathed by God's Spirit. God's Spirit breathed the Word of God to us, breathed it out to us. So it is spiritual thoughts put together with spiritual words, according to 1 Corinthians. Uh, it was supervised. The holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, uh, according to 2 Peter 1.21. It was, it was, overseen by the Holy Spirit.
and we're I the treasure. Uh, I don't. I don't mean to cut in, sir. But yeah. um, But you're actually out of time, and I okay. need to uh, to move Bye. that back Bye. over. When you when you said the breeze breeze in, like almost like the breath of life. No, it's like speaking words. Okay. It says gotcha. it's as if it. And let me clarify. Uh, when when the Holy Spirit spoke the word of God, he didn't whisper in someone's ear and say, in, in, the, the, beginning, beginning, God, God. No, no, he used Moses' mind, personality, thoughts. He gave him the thoughts and he supervised the words so that the thoughts were correct and the words were correct. That's what called verbal plenary inspiration. Gotcha. And that's what I believe in. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Jay. I'm going to give you eight minutes on the clock. That's about what that opening was. Go ahead. Okay. I apologize. I am <clears throat> I am sick, so I'm having to eat cough drops here while I uh, while I do this. So I'm not trying to be disrespectful to anybody. So. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right. So. Um. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I think. Uh, uh, I took some notes as I listened to that opening statement and I'll, I'll make my opening statement on the basis of some of the notes that I took and uh, <clears throat> some of the texts that I think from the Bible actually vindicate the notion of uh, extra biblical tradition in the sense of oral tradition <clears throat> and in the sense of church tradition being things that are absolutely necessary uh, as well as the, the text of scripture. So I, I definitely agree with the, uh, my guest about the way that he uh my opponent the way the way that he described inspiration i think that uh we are agreed that <clears throat> the text in my view uh from the orthodox perspective the way i understand our, our teaching is that we think that they are inspired i believe that they are inerrant i think that that is the uh, consensus of the church fathers that the texts don't contain errors um i think that his analogy that he used uh, for synergy between <clears throat> between man and god in terms of that inspiration uh as i understand him i would agree with that but where I don't agree is the, the first mistake that I heard uh, from my position is that uh, he cited Psalm 19 about uh, the word of God is perfect. The law is perfect. So in my view, the word of God does not have a single referent. I think that most of the time Protestants take the word of God, the, the phrase word of God to have a single referent, namely the written uh, uh, text of scripture. In my view, the, the predominant <clears throat> referent in a lot of these texts that Protestants are thinking is about the text is actually to the second person of the Godhead, who is Jesus himself, the Logos. For example, in John 1, John refers to Jesus as the person, as the Word of God. So in fact, the text that he referred to in Psalm 19, while I do think they have an application to the written text, the written texts are actually pointing to the second person of the Godhead, who is not identical to the written text. The written texts are his letter, so to speak, we could say. But I don't think that that's the only word that the Word of God spoke, especially to the church. In fact, in the epistles of Timothy, <clears throat> Paul to Timothy, and in Peter's epistles, we find reference to the Word of God as what the apostles also preached. Pass on to <clears throat> uh, good men after you, Timothy, the words that you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, right? And so we know Paul taught for uh, at least three years in Ephesus, according to the book of Acts. And so the entire apostolic deposit uh, is what Paul taught for those three years. That's what's commanded to be handed down to Timothy at Ephesus. And, and Paul says to Timothy, I laid hands on you. You lay hands on men after you and do not give the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> uh, which is given by the laying on of hands hastily. Make sure that you're passing it on to a good person because the gift of the Holy Spirit is transferred in that laying on of hands. In our view, that is an actual real historic apostolic succession. And so even from the text where we would go to <clears throat> in terms of Paul commanding this uh, tradition be passed on, Paul says uh, to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, he gives a standing command to pass on not just what was written, but also the oral teachings. Whatever I said to you, whether oral or written, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, you pass those things on. And that's exactly what he said to Timothy as well in both of the epistles to Timothy. So for us, word of God is not restricted to written text. It also goes beyond that to the entire apostolic deposit, which would include the sense of the Old Testament scriptures, not the text themselves, that's part of it, but also the interpretation, the sense of that. As the Ethiopian eunuch says, how can I understand unless someone guides me? The church plays that role of guiding and helping us to understand not just which, the, which texts are the text of scripture, but the interpretation of that text. 
So I think a lot of times in the case of Protestants, we have this assumption that texts just mean what they say and they say what they mean. But in fact, they also require interpretation. So I think it's more it's more nuanced than that. Next, I would note that <clears throat> um, the canon of Scripture is something that is a historical fact determined by the church. This is not up to debate. I don't think it's up to uh, uh, ad hoc sort of uh, reasoning or just postulating that, well, I'm a Protestant. We have the right canon because I've prayed about it, the Holy Spirit led me. I'm not saying he's saying that, but oftentimes that's what we hear from Protestants. My view, we have to have the history of the church to not just <clears throat> tell us which books were compiled and put together, because that's something that for the Orthodox Church happened at the Council of Trello that's reaffirmed at the Seventh Ecumenical Council. <clears throat> we also need the church to tell us which of these texts is apostolic. For example, the Gospel of Matthew doesn't identify its author. And so for us to know that it's Matthew the Apostle is part of church tradition. And while that's not the only reason that we include Matthew in the gospel in, in the in the four synoptic gospels, uh, excuse me, in the four gospels, part of the reason that we include Matthew is because <clears throat> we have the tr the tradition of the church that is passed on in the different seas of the, ap the apostolic seas and the apostolic succession in the important churches in the early in early Rome. We know by tradition that those are the, the, the those are apostolic texts, and so uh, apostolic authorship, which is very important cannot be known apart from the, the testimony and tradition of the church. That doesn't mean that I'm saying every tradition in the church is identical to the divine word of God or is necessarily inspired or in, infallible. <laughs> but there is this, <clears throat> uh, I believe, biblical notion of tradition that goes beyond just the written text. And I think this was true even in the Old Testament. Uh, for example, if we look at <clears throat> Second Chronicles 29 concerning King he Hezekiah, we have this story about how he stationed the liturgical worship but we don't have any record of what David himself commanded concerning these things. And so David being, I think, 250 years before Hezekiah, uh, we know that the, the according to Leviticus, the story of Nadab and Abihu, you can't worship God the way that you want to. It has to be done according to, how much time do I have? You way. have two minutes, Jay. Okay. <clears throat> worship can't be done according to uh, man's fran fancy, right? It's very important that it's done according to the pr prescriptions that God lays down. And so even in the Old Testament, although we do have liturgical uh, worship that's given in terms of the st structure of the temple and the tabernacle and all that, the <clears throat> musical arrangements of the liturgical services, David's Psalms themselves, we're not exactly told how that's supposed to go down. And so Hezekiah is doing this on the basis of oral tradition, according to Second Chronicles 29. Beyond that, we have examples, <clears throat> even in the Old Testament, where a lot of extra canonical texts are referred to. Uh, random books, uh, uh, the book of the just, the book of, uh, of <clears throat> uh, uh, Addo the seer, et cetera, Diff these different books that are referred to that are non-canonical, as well as the New Testament citation of the book of Jude. Of course, Jude is not canonical, <clears throat> but we can refer to these extra canonical traditions because it was not the apostolic attitude that, that the text alone were the means by which the church was to be run. And I would add that uh, for all of Paul's injunctions in the New Testament and Corinthians against the abuse of worship, there is no New Testament liturgy. And so if God cares about liturgy, which he set, certainly does by killing Nadab and Abihu for offering strange fire, where is the New Testament presentation of how we are supposed to worship God? Well, the answer is that we know from the history of the church and reading the church fathers that the apostles laid down apostolic liturgies that are not written in scripture, but they are liturgies that derive from the temple and the, the synagogue worship service that the apostles by their apostolic authority gave to the church to be the normative means of worship. And by, when we go to the church fathers, we find that that's liturgical worship. We find that it's the Eucharist. We find that the Eucharist is an oblation and an offering as Hebrews 13 says it is. We have an altar by which we have <clears throat> the right to eat, which those who serve at the tabernacle have no right to eat. That's the Eucharistic altar that's mentioned by uh, uh, St. Justin Martyr uh, in 150. It's mentioned by uh, Irenaeus and against heresies in 180. So from the earliest days of the, uh, of the post-apostolic church, we know that the worship that they passed on into the seas that they founded, like we see that pattern of passing on the succession to Timothy in Ephesus, the Orthodox church has that same church in Ephesus. Do you know that there's still an Orthodox church in Ephesus which traces its lineage back to what Paul is passing down to Timothy? And so that is the apostolic tradition, which can't be divorced from the text of scripture because it is the liturgy itself and the daily readings, the lectionaries by which the church used that, that tradition to help determine 
what books go into the Bible. So by every time that he cites the canon of scripture, by going to the Bible, he's de facto presupposing that the Orthodox church has the correct tradition by going to the books that they put together. Thank you for that opening statement as well, Jay. And thank you everybody for tuning in for this debate tonight. Before I open the floor up, just remember that I need a new computer and it's up to you to give it to I'm kidding. Obviously send the super chats in though. We appreciate them. Don't know if we're going to take callers tonight because it sounds like Jay's got kind of a rough voice. So I don't know if we're going to do it or not. We'll see how he feels when we get closer to time. Gentlemen, I'll go as long as my voice is here. Okay, gentlemen, the floor is open. Well, you said a lot, so uh, I, I I probably won't cover half of uh, you know what you said, but I do have a lot to say. First of all, the core of the word of the Bible, the Word of God, is the gospel, and uh, the, in fact, the very construction of the Bible speaks to that. You have in the Old Testament, you have the law and the prophets and the writings. And, prof, and and the historical books you have. So you have four divisions. In the New Testament, you have four Gospels, the book of Acts, which is historical, the epistles, and the book of Revelation. So you have a balance with Christ being the theme of all of it. Jesus said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. In, in, in searching the scriptures, you think that that grants you eternal life. But these are they which testify of me. So all of it is about Jesus, and that's the word of the gospel, which is the core of the Bible. So if, if I'm speaking to you folks out there that you, you, you may be Bible students. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, please don't miss the, the, big, the, the big, most important thing in that book, in that big book. You know, there's, there's almost 1,200 chapters in the book, 31,000 verses. And there's a lot in that book, but there's one theme. And if you miss the theme, you've missed the, you've, you've wasted your time as far as I'm concerned. And that is Jesus and his death on the cross for you and his payment for your sins. And if you re repent and believe in him, you can have eternal life. And well, sir, sir, I don't mean to, I don't mean to cut in, but, um, Right now is the time to address the opponent uh, who's in the debate with you. And we'll give you time to address the audience, I promise. But for now, we can focus on the arguments so we can keep the debate on track. Well, I appreciate that. But, you know, when I'm talking, I get excited about the gospel. So I want you to understand that, you know, he mentioned that, uh, you know, the, the, the Bible is, is not, is not and, and the truth is not just the Bible, but it's, it's the word in, in wherever it speaks. And uh, the Bible is the word of God, but the core of the Bible is the word of the gospel. You know, I uh, pastored in New York City for many years, and basically everyone that came to my church was a former Catholic or Greek Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox. And um, they were, they came, I'll use the word ignorant, I don't, I don't mean to put them down, but they came uh, knowing nothing of the word of God, and they were hungering for the word of God, and I taught them the word. And uh, I taught them once a week in their homes. And then I had a Sunday school class on Sunday morning. And then I preached in church. And then I had a training in the class on Sunday evening. And then I preached on Sunday evening. Then I had a Wednesday night service where I taught the word of God. And then I get like I say, then again, I had a home Bible study. So I taught them five to six times a week. And they were hungering for it. They had ne never heard it. And one time I... Uh, one of their, they had one of their priests come over to to basically rebuke me. You know, how dare you, you try to steal my flock? And I said, Sir, I, I'm just trying to feed your flock. I'm not trying to steal it. So he said, uh, he said, Well, you know, you're 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 teaching the Bible by it's Bible, 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 Bible. You you know, it's it's not just the Bible. There's a lot more than Bible. And we started uh, you know debating about whether what the Bible is and what it should contain, and we. We, we got off on the Apocrypha. Yeah, but, but sir, uh, sir, can I have you address the arguments that Jay was making? Yes, I'm, I'm getting there. Okay. He said, this is what he said. He said, young man, he said, we wrote it. And if we want to, we can add the Apocrypha to it. We can, we can make changes wherever we feel like we need to. And uh, no, you, 
so the the church can't change the word of God. We can't add to it. We can't take away from it. It's okay, a perfect. So I, I'm not trying to be perfect, rude, but, but did you hear me make that argument that the church changed the word of God? You you said that basically the church has had the oversight of God's word. Do you think oversight it, and change? It, do you think it, oversight it, and change mean the same thing? Yeah, I think uh, you 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 can't ha you, you, think you don't those have words mean the same thing. They don't mean the same thing. Well, maybe not to you. But uh, how no, come they could not to me? In fact, the word oversight does not mean the same thing as change. OK, so when they added the Apocrypha, was, was that is that something that bothers you? <clears throat> I don't believe the Apocrypha was added. Well, the, the Council of Worms, you know, they were they were bringing Martin Luther up on charges of heresy. And uh, they said he said, I don't believe in purgatory. And they said, well, it's in the Bible. And he said, no, it's not. It's in the Apocrypha. And they adjourned to the other room and came back. And they said, it is now. Well, that's very flippant. That's a very flippant attitude well, toward I, the I word of God. To, right. So, but I don't mean to be rude, but as Orthodox, we don't believe in purgatory. So that's a Roman Catholic teaching and also uh, a council that condemns, uh, you know, Martin Luther really doesn't have anything to do with, with what we're arguing today. So, the, well, the point is churches are are not perfect my no church that i was ever in was perfect and no church that you've ever been in is perfect sure, and i agree with that so so we 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 have to end up back at the word of god studying the word of god and feeding our soul on the word of god and so it's very odd to me that uh the people who i mean I, again i i spent many years in new york city I didn't find Greek Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox having Bible studies, Bible studies, Bible studies, nor, nor did I find Catholics or Anglicans uh, or even Lutherans. Uh, uh, it was us, us Baptists, if you want to use the word fundamentalist, I, I'm not sure if that applies to me perfectly, but um, it was us that, that have a burden to, to teach the Word of God to, right, I mean, to the masses. Can I reply to that? Sure. So the first thing I would say is that... Um, in my experience in the Orthodox Church is that we're always uh, doing biblical stuff. In fact, every <clears throat> service that you go to is nothing but constant biblical readings. In fact, some of the Russian services are so long uh, that you'll get tired standing there listening to all the biblical readings. So uh, maybe that was an experience that you had at a you know a Greek parish in New York or whatever, but that hasn't been my experience. Uh, in fact, the, the Orthodox liturgy is nothing but constant immersion in Scripture. Secondly, I would say to that point about the Apocrypha, you know, in, in our view, <clears throat> the New Testament in many places cites the, the Apocrypha, and I could give you uh, Protestant scholars, for example, the Lee, <clears throat> Lee McDonald is a famous Baptist evangelical scholar, and he's got an entire appendix in the uh, back of his book, Formation of the Christian Biblical Canon, where he cites about 10 pages with dozens of references of New Testament citations of the, the Deuterocanon. And so for us, when you get into the early church fathers, you'll find that they also pretty typically cite the deuterocanonical books as well, and even in many cases to prove doctrines or to prove points. So while it's true that some church fathers didn't have a very high place for the Apocrypha like St. Jerome, uh, in our view, by the time of the 5th and 6th century, the consensus of the church was that we would accept these as secondary canon or deuterocanon. And that's because they're referenced so many times in the New Testament and by the early church. So, um, I mean, I, I don't believe, by the way, that the Dura Canon teaches purgatory. So I would agree with you that, and Martin Luther that we shouldn't believe in purgatory. But um, I, I, what, I did want to respond to the previous points uh, as, in regard to the Dura Canon itself. All right. So in 1054, you have what's called the Great Schism. Everybody knows that. And so you end up with two traditions, you know, the Eastern tradition, Byzantine, and the Roman Catholic, the Roman tradition. And they diverge, and they go their separate ways. Now, they started out at basically the same place. They had already started having some, some issues, <laughs> obviously, but, but they, they really diverged, and they really went separate ways after that. Now, who's to say? You know, I, I, I have a number of priests, uh, Catholic priests, friends, um, I'm, I'm pro-life. So I found myself on buses with Catholic priests quite often. <laughs> so we would uh, discuss doctrine and they're adamant, adamant that their tradition, their liturgy, and, uh, what they do is, is, uh, is apostolically, you know, apostolic and, and it goes back through apostolic succession to Peter. And, uh, then of course, 
all of the East, Eastern churches would say the same. Who's to say which is right? Well, I mean, the fact that people disagreed really doesn't have anything to do with the truth or falsity of each, either position. Okay, so how is? You, you, and I'm not got, trying to be. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just saying that. that no, doesn't, it's, it that's doesn't, not. It doesn't. It doesn't constitute an argument. Yes, it does. Because if there's a thousand people watching out there, or ten thousand people watching out there, they want to know. Wait a minute, which one's right? Sure. Uh, uh, they are. They're both. You know, a, 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 a thousand years old, or you know, since the schism, well, it's, it's and the they've gone different a, ways. So, which one's it's, right? It's the positing of a question, though. It's not an argument in a philosophical sense. Well, it's it's begging the question because they're going to have to make the the, well they're because they're going to have to make a, a a decision which one is right and they're going to have to then go and study the Eastern tradition and the Western tradition and then say oh, I think this one's right and I think this one's wrong you know sure. they've got to make a decision so yeah. I, I I feel like it puts people in a, in an impossible spot if you stick with the Word of God you don't you don't need to be yeah. making decisions like that you stick with the Word let the Word feed your soul. Okay, so, but the problem with that is how do you have an a priori knowledge of what the correct canon of Scripture is? Okay, we, I believe that God superintended the, and as, as I yeah, said, I, I, I too. So, but, well, but, but I'm saying, how do you know which canon is correct? Well, there's only one canon uh, from the Council of Carthage. There's one canon well, that came why forth. Why are we supposed to follow Carthage on your view? Well, as I, I, and as I said, there have been times that the church got it right, and that okay, was one so that was the Carthage church got right? it right. Why is Carthage right? I believe that God superintended it, as I said. I believe he watched but over it and made sure that the that right one, books got arbitrary. in. That's arbitrary. Why not the other councils? Well, that was the one that that got that's passed the down. the one that backs up your position. That's, that's, no, that's the one that got passed down. Council of Carthage is the where we got our our 27 books in the New Testament. So it it, 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 it defined what well, the, the New Council Testament is. The Council of Carthage is. teaches all kinds of things like baptismal regeneration. It teaches... Um, all the doctrines that we hold as Orthodox because the canons of Carthage, by the way, Carthage is a whole bunch of synods. It's reaffirmed at the, at the time of the Council of, of Trollo, which is affirmed at Nicaea too. And so you wouldn't hold to anything else taught by the councils of Carthage other than what you're saying is the New Testament text. But I'm just saying it's arbitrary. Why, why should we follow that when you reject everything else that Carthage says? Well, again, I believe that there are times when the church when the church has gotten it right, and when it agrees with the word of God, it it gets it right there. So and basically, there times, the word of God is just your views. Well, so what my understanding, I've spent my life trying to be trying to understand it, understand it, and and uh, hold myself accountable to it. Okay. So, so yes, what I'm asking you about is the actual contents of the word of God, and you're saying that I follow what follows the word of God, but this is about the putting in, into into the, the word of God, the books of the word of God. Yes. And, okay, so and how it, do you it, know that that's the right canon with the right, the right council with the right canon? <clears throat> I believe that their their decision was based on. Uh, we are not going to allow any books into this, any new books or, or any books in the canon of Scripture for the New Testament, unless they first of all agree one hundred percent with the Old Testament, do not contradict the Old Testament, and second of all, have the uh, 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 supervision of an apostle. And so they threw out hundreds of books and they ended up with 27. That, yeah, but you don't agree with their Old Testament canon because they support the Deutero canon. That, again, when you say Deutero canon, they do not hold, uh, no one yes, holds that up at, at the equal, as equal with the, with the Bible. No yeah, one holds that up as equal with the Bible. It doesn't matter because the, the totality of that council is affirming all the things that I affirm as well as the Deuterocanonical text. I mean, you even, you even cited the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, which include the Deuterocanonical text. So it's a, what's going on is that you have a picking and choosing that is arbitrary. Well, again, I, I'm taking, I start with the old and then I go to the new and I try to line my doctrine up. Okay, but, but how do you when, know that the Deuterocanon isn't part of the old? That's what, I'm, that's what I'm, so you have a presupposition that it's not part of the old and you're saying I'm starting with the old. Well, I, my understanding of the Council of, Nicaea, uh, of Carthage was that there were many books excluded from the, the, and when we say canon, we're talking about a very small number of books, a very thin, yeah, you very thin New Testament, New Testament books. And you're saying that Carthage is wrong when the councils, plural of Carthage, also cite the Deuterocanonical books. You're saying they're wrong there. Okay. I, I, we're going to have to, at least, at least we're being clear. You know, sometimes you have to just clarify and agree to disagree. But uh, I, I, I accept 
what that they decided as far as the canon of the New Testament. Okay, I do right. not accept. I, I do not accept the deuterocanonical books. Right. I, I'm I, saying I, well, I, on what basis is that the council that you're going to when you don't accept what they say about anything? Again, else? we're gonna we're gonna we're we're gonna have to agree to disagree. I believe that they were consistent when on their uh, uh, decision and, and their criteria for what. But you just said they're not consistent because you don't accept the other things that Carthage teaches. I don't so, agree with everything they taught because right. there are a lot of things that they taught that were that I cannot so find what I'm in the asking Bible. Is how do you know they're right about the New Testament? Again, I, I believe that when they made those two decisions of uh, the agreeing with the Old Testament and the authority of the apostles, those were the right. That was the right decision from my from my vantage point. So, I, you know, I'm but, studying the Word of God every day. Right, but it's begging the question because you're saying that what agrees with the Old Testament, but if the Deuterocanon is part of the Old Testament, then that that doesn't work. Okay, so so your priest gets up and he teaches the Deuterocanonical books on a Sunday morning, every Sunday, instead of the Word of God? Is that right? No, every liturgy has the readings of Paul and then it has the readings of the Gospel. So there's not uh -huh. any, there, he doesn't preach the Deuterocanon every Sunday. Okay, why not? Because the liturgy is specific that you do the readings of Paul and then the gospel. Okay, so if if they're equal, I mean, shouldn't you have be having just uh, tons of well, Bible I, studies? I right, so I don't think that they're equal in the sense that they're all, they all come to us from God, but they're not equal in the sense of importance. For us, the gospels have a special place above even the epistles of Paul. That doesn't who, mean that the epistles of said, Paul aren't who's, inspired. Who, who said, why, why, why are they more important than anything else? Because they're the centerpiece of the liturgy, which is what I argued in the opening statement was something that the apostles handed down, which you don't have. Okay, but you, you're, you are arbitrarily choosing a, a, a portion of the Bible to be more important no. than anything else. Why, it's why, not arbitrary do that? because I believe in tradition and I cited the example of liturgy as an apostolic tradition. So wouldn't, uh, you know, there, there were... Um, I looked up uh, the Eastern churches, and there are 40, 50 different uh, uh, so you're going branches. Back to, you're going back to a fallacy. This has nothing to do with what's true or false. Yes, it does, because it's each one of the, why, why are they, why are they separate? Why are they separate? Why do you have copies? Well, I'm not trying to be rude to and, you, but and, do you and, understand and, that and, that's a fallacy? That's but, a logical fallacy. The fact no, that you, people dis, that the fact that people disagree has nothing to do with which one is true or false. But but you are arbitrarily choosing what you're believing, and other churches are believing what they're it's believing. Like, it's arbitrary. Argument. Look, it's arbitrary that the Coptics do do what they do, and the Egyptian Orthodox do what the they Coptics do, and the, the Armenians the do what they the do. Same liturgy that we do. So that actually argues my point, and that's my uh, point about liturgy, which is that the ancient apostolic liturgies are handed down. They're not in the Bible. They're handed down by the apostles, and the entire ancient church believe that. And you're well, saying that doesn't matter. I don't care. It's it's not arbitrary. It's an actual historical argument. And by the way, I could cite you countless Protestant scholars that would admit that point. Okay. Well, I grew up in a pretty liturgical church, and uh, our time in the Word of God was limited because we'd had to do, you know, so many, you know, the Our Father and the Gloria Patri and you know this, that, and the other, and uh, it was it was a busy service with all of the accoutrements of liturgy and uh for me they they were it, they weren't it wasn't that they were meaningless but for me i was hungering for the word of god and when i finally got into a church where the word of god was being taught my soul got fed and i think that part of the reason why europe is post-christian today is because liturgy put them to sleep and didn't teach them Okay, so did God put the Old Testament Israelites to sleep for centuries or for millennia when he had liturgical worship? Again, the liturgy of the Old Testament is totally different from the liturgy of churches. How would and, the and, argument... And, 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 no, it's and, not. You, you don't even... I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be rude to you, but I mean, I could cite, cite you countless scholars that point out that the church's liturgy, liturgy comes directly from the temple and the synagogue. And so if your argument is that liturgy itself is a problem that puts people to sleep, then you're faulting God for giving liturgical worship. I mean, where do you, how do you think Jesus worshiped in his local synagogue? Okay, look, I, I've been, to, as a Jewish missionary, I have been to many synagogues. Uh, and uh, a, synagogue, a synagogue worship is basically nothing like a an Orthodox service or a Catholic no, service or an against, Anglican you're service. You're literally going against every scholar in the history of liturgy. Because they would all tell you, again, that the history of the church's liturgy comes out of both the temple and the synagogue, and that's not even disputed in any of the scholars. 
You know, it, it bothers me that people, uh, my church was nothing but, uh, made up of nothing but people that had grown up on liturgy. And uh, they, of course, they they missed the the uh, incense and they missed the, the holy water and they missed the candles and they missed a lot of the the things that were part of the liturgy. They yeah, missed which, it. But, which is in the book of Revelation, right? When John sees the heavenly worship, he sees all that same stuff, right? Uh, uh, there may be liturgy in heaven. That's fine. But but on, so on earth, you said it puts they people need to sleep. So is God putting people to sleep in heaven? I don't think so. I think there, when you get around the throne, it's a, it's an amazing with thunder and lightning and angels flying and and the light and the yeah, so God has multitudes of nations. So I, I'm not I'm not sure that that's I'm Testament. not sure that that's liturgy. I think you're making an assumption that you can't you you haven't been there. I haven't been there. And I don't. I mean, I don't, John I, saw it, so he told. I don't. Us I don't know that he saw liturgy. Yeah. I, Okay. okay. Well, he, he, he saw the, worship. He saw worship. He and I think that worship will change. Singing. He describes antiphonal singing. That's lit liturgy. He describes vestments. He describes an altar. He describes incense being offered by the saints in heaven. All of these are liturgical elements for us. So if you want to take issue with that, that's fine. But you're basically saying that liturgical worship is fine for the Old Testament. It's fine for heaven, but it's boring for the church. And yeah, I'm first, just saying that you're, the issue here seems to be that you have a problem with liturgical worship, perhaps based on your your past previous experiences in, the, in I guess you were raised Roman Catholic or Anglican or something. I'm, I don't know. But why would that have anything to do your bad experiences with whether this is true or false? Well, the Apostle Paul, when he was talking about the gifts, he, he was say he said that, you know, there, there are the seven gifts and pray and ask God that you should prophesy. And the preaching, thats the, I believe that's the preaching of the Word of God. And that's the center of a service. You know, everything else is secondary. The, the preaching of the Word of God, the teaching well, of I mean, the Word of God to change that, lives, I mean, the, the, the preaching of the gospel to, is central. To eat. So you're saying I, that it's all about hearing a lecture service or something, a lecture or something like that. But, I mean, that's just presupposing your position. That's assuming that the apostles didn't hand down a liturgy where the focus of the service was communion. Well, I don't, I don't see, uh, I, I, as I see it, the preaching of the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God was central to the New Testament church. Liturgy was secondary. If there was liturgy, if you want to call it that, it was secondary. And, uh, uh, it, you know, churches right off the bat became corrupted. That's why the Apostle John wrote to the seven churches of Asia Minor, okay, but because was the there was already... Was, was Carthage the, corrupt? I, I don't, I, I'm sure it wasn't perfect. I'm, what I'm saying is, as far as the Council of Carthage, you keep going back to that, and I'm, I'm almost sorry well, I mentioned it's, it. But, it's but because it's what you, I believe it's an that, arbitrary choice for you that that's the, the one that's right. And when I, I believe that why, the church, I believe the church gets it right sometimes. Once in a while, okay. the church and, gets it right. And when but, I asked you why is Carthage humans. right, you said because it's consistent with the Old Testament and the apostles. And that's, okay. that's the, to me, that's begging the question. The Word of God is perfect. And we got to keep, we okay. got to keep preaching and teaching the word of God. And, and, and it, that's got to be primary. If you want to have liturgy. Okay, fine. If you want to, if you want to, I, I, you know, I've been to, I've, I've gone to monasteries. Well, I've spent a week in a monastery here and there. I, I, I've seen it uh, and, and it's fine, but sir, uh, I left me, liturgical let me try to get worship. This, uh, back on track a little bit. So the, the argument kind of that I think Jay is trying to make here is, uh, in the beginning of this, you said, look, it's very important that everybody in the audience and everybody who's watching this debate and will watch this debate knows which church, which canon, which everything to follow. That was very important to you. Jay is saying, how do you know that Carthage, which is this thing that you claim is kind of the grounding or foundation for your current belief structure? Why is that true? That's that's the question. So he's kind of asking you in your own world. If this is what you're basing everything on, can you justify that? So that's that's where maybe the confusion is at. I mean, the, okay. the, the people at Carthage were bishops. They believed in apostolic succession and they were in the episcopate, right? They had liturgies. So what I'm pointing out is that I believe everything that they believed, right? And, okay, so and and, and the Council of, of Trollo reaffirms Carthage and includes includes these books that you say don't exist in the old testament and you're just saying i want that council and i want their new testament and i don't want anything else and i'm just saying that's arbitrary i believe that god has confirmed and blessed the choice of those books you got uh, martin luther came along 
just after Gutenberg had invented the printing yeah, press, it, okay. and, and Erasmus had gotten together the Textus Receptus. Martin Luther then translated his Bible, and then it was printed on a printing press and sent sent well, everywhere. Who, who, and do you the, think and, who do you think transmitted the received text? I, I, it came through the church. It no, came through the church, but Erasmus where, put it all together. It had not been. Where does the received text come from? It had it come through the church, as I just said. No, it's a specific church. Which one? Okay. I, it it it's came through both. It's the Byzantine New Testament. Byzantine Testament. church. It came, well, of course, at the schism, you know, the Byzantine church had what it had. And the Catholic that is church the received then. Text. So, so the New Testament collection known as the received text is the Byzantine text. Okay. And that you're right. That's so what that's we call the, Orthodox it, the Byzantine, the Byzantine the Orthodox text. Church. That doesn't nullify what I'm saying. Well, do you that, understand that, it's the Orthodox Church? It does, you know, doesn't matter. The doesn't matter. Argument. Doesn't matter what we call it. It's the it's the books it's, that it's are not, in that. It's what it is. It's, it's the 27 a, books that are in no, the New Testament that you're Martin the Luther. You're you're, <clears> you're, <throat> you're 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 no. You're trying to nullify what I'm. I'm trying to tell you that I believe God you blessed want the books without the church that put the books together. That's well, the, the, that's the meaning. Martin Luther put those put those into German. And God you blessed that translation. That it was the received text, and then, and you and didn't then know again, it was the, you didn't and know then that again, it was the Byzantine text. And then again, God did it again. He blessed it in the in the early 1600s, between 1600 and 1620, when uh, the translators, this the, when the translators put together the the King James Bible. And again, I'm not a King James believer per se. Okay, but uh, you already I, admitted I like I like part. it. I like I like it. But I believe God blessed the King James Version, nonetheless, okay. and it has none been the version that has that has changed. Right? Yes, they, they, God problem. has blessed it. You cannot deny the blessing of God on England and on the United States and this around the world, arbitrary, where the where the history. where the King James Version has been distributed. Yeah, it, all right, it's it's only, God's blessing. Go you can't deny it. Time, guys, we go it's, do you deny blessing. the blessing of God on the King James Version? It's only blessings if your position is correct, and you already said failed because you didn't even realize the byzantine text which is the new testament text you're talking about is the received text and it doesn't matter it doesn't it doesn't matter what you call it you, you just can call it what said you want that god okay. so you're admitting that god used the byzantine church to preserve your bible <laughs> doesn't matter doesn't matter god god then so, took, and it, took it doesn't the books. matter because it refutes your position so you don't want it okay. to matter so they, didn't translate, they, they didn't translate it into german and they didn't translate it into english your position. they didn't translate it in german they didn't translate it in english they were going to keep it you're just as it was so you're just you know asserting. martin luther thank god he did, he took what erasmus did and he went the next step and translate into German, and then thank God the okay. King James so translators. He, he just rambles and asserts went ahead. He argue. This is not even an argument. It's just him asserting his position and asserting how I'm, awesome uh, Martin Luther so, so, is. And so, God, no, you he, don't. So you you, you don't believe that, that God blessed the King awesome James if your position is correct, and that's the thing in question. Right? So you don't believe that God blessed the King James version at all. Again, it's the received text, and many Orthodox churches use that text. So you're just ignoring. Okay, but it's the not in English. The received text was in Greek. Okay, so what about the, the English? The what about King the German? James is based on the received text. Obviously, that's what I'm saying. Okay, and and so why didn't the why didn't the Greek Orthodox Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church translate it into German and English so it could go around the world and be because printed on their Gutenberg printing press? Because the Roman Catholics are in Germany. Okay, I mean, but again, the, the, they're going to keep it in Greek. They're going to keep it away. The ortho so Can what good is it if it's just stop in Greek? Boomer rambling just for a second. Do you understand that oh, we always on, man. we always translate it into the vernacular? So you so the Greek when did the Greek Orthodox Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church translate the Bible into into English? When was that? When they came to America. I I've not seen it. Sorry, I'm I'm going to have to be ignorant on that. I've not seen it. But they they didn't give it to Britain, and they didn't. As far as I know, I, I I've been None in ministry for fifty years. I haven't seen right I haven't seen a Greek these, Orthodox an argument for the English Bible, which is what I've asked you. you I believe God has blessed. God has blessed. I'm, that's what, not an what? argument. I know that you think that, but I'm asking you a specific point about how you know. And you're saying, I believe God blessed this. So fact. you're going to, but no, you, you're, are you going to tell me that God did not bless what the, what King James translators did? And well, you're uh, equivocating on blessing because God can bless anybody at any place. That doesn't mean that that's the right canon of scripture. So are, I mean, and the, I can and, just, and, I, and, you're saying, I can turn that argument around on you and say that God has blessed the Orthodox churches for their preservation of the scripture in Russia. 
I mean, that doesn't prove anything. This is a non-argument. Okay. So, so uh, the the uh, uh, Great Awakening here in the in the Americas before yeah, the, all, the, all the of that is States only Great was Awakening a, if your view the, is correct. Was the if Protestantism so, is correct? That's so you the don't, only way you don't all believe this in stuff that stuff is a blessing and a Great Awakening. And that's the so, thing in question is whether so you don't think so. Correct. You don't think so. No. Every time was you it, assert wasn't these a things, great, no, so it wasn't you, a great awakening. I'm asking you about your position, not the thousand assertions of your position. Do you understand okay, that? So, that's, no, that's, I'm, that's I'm asking you. Thing. So you deny, it sounds to me like you deny God's blessing on the of the King James. You deny the great awakening. You're denying history. I'm not I, denying I, it. I'm saying it doesn't prove the point about who has the right canon. It's a very simple argument. I don't, I'm sorry that you can't follow it. I'm sorry. Okay. So God, I believe God is blessing his word. None of that is an argument. The fact yes, it is. Research, no, it's not. Do you understand what an argument is? Yeah, to That's bring, not an argument. To, to kind of to to bring this back around again and see if we can close it one more time, uh, Pastor P, what he's, what he's asking specifically here is, look, um, from, from your perspective, he wants to know why you, you think this is true, why you think Protestantism is true. You say because it has the blessing of God. OK, well, that's fair enough. But he's asking you, well, couldn't anybody say that? Why do you know that this is true, that that this blessing is actually true? Why, so he, like he says, you you know, if I just said this book, for instance, is blessed by God, what makes that untrue? OK, I believe God has supervised the the canon collection. That's not an argument. Down through you the years. You understand there's a difference between a stating a position and arguing the position. Okay. And and Erasmus ended up with that canon. And he co collected it, put it together for Martin Luther to translate it to German, to print and distribute, which then uh, ended up in the, in, the, uh, in the English Isles, British Isles, which ended up in America. I believe we, we see the hand of God on his word. Okay, so this is an over. argument, and I'm just going to keep reinserting that this is not an argument until you make an actual argument. <laughs> All right. As I said before, churches, men, can, can become corrupted as well as uh, deceived and so yeah. forth. And what's so, the principle so, by so, which Carthage so, isn't corrupt? So I... I, I'm not saying Carthage was or wasn't corrupt. I believe they got it right as far as the canon. That okay, one what's thing. What's the principle for that? That one How thing. How do you know that? What's the what's principle this? that you know that by? Oh, the blessing of God over okay. and over and How over. How do you know that it's the blessing of God? Because I, anybody can say that. Well, I, I, I believe I think that God it was, blessed my canon. Well, I believe God. I, I'll, I'll have I, to I'm say. I'm not it. interested in what you believe. I want to know the arguments. Do you understand the difference between an argument and asserting your position and what you believe? Those are two different things. Okay, you, if you, if we go back to the Great Schism, and we say, and you, and I guess you would say that at the Great Schism, the Eastern or Eastern Church separated from the Western Church. The Western Church grew much, much larger. It's today four times the size of the Eastern Church, which doesn't mean anything necessarily. Doesn't mean anything necessarily, but the Eastern Church kept its traditions. So it, it stakes its life on those traditions and its liturgy, et cetera, et cetera, which is not exactly the same as the Roman church or the Anglican church or the Lutheran church. Everybody's got their, their liturgy, you know? And, so do you uh, understand that if I sat here and said that I believe my position over and over and over, that that wouldn't constitute an argument? Okay, but you're, can you say that the, just because the Eastern church has their tradition, that it's necessarily the right one? What makes theirs right? And they, uh, it's a schism. So one went one way, one went the other. Who's to say I, I, I can't, who's right? I'm sorry, but do you not understand what, do you know what logical fallacies are? Okay, you're, are you not going to answer my question? Yeah. Wh which one, how do you know which is right? What you're asking is a fallacy. They're not the same. Yes, it is. It's, there's no fallacy. They're not the same. Okay. The Catholic let me give you an example liturgy is not is, the let same. Let me give you an example why this is a fallacy. Okay. There's 30,000 Protestant denominations. Therefore, nobody knows which one is correct. That's a fallacy. The fact that there's a bunch of denominations has literally nothing to do with which one is true and which ones are false. That's a fallacy. Do you not understand that? So the same yeah. thing applies to the fact that there was an East-West schism. The fact that there's a schism has nothing to do with which one is true or false. No, but you're, you're choosing you. one. No, you're choosing one. You chose one. Which? Why did you choose sure. that one? Why? Because it's not the false one, because there's argumentation behind why. 
and you don't think that uh, there are uh, 100,000 Catholic priests that would, would disagree with you on that and say, what, wait that a is minute. Not, that's a fallacy. It has nothing to do with which one's true or false. It's not. So do you think truth is determined by consensus? I believe that, that every every person's got to choose uh, based on the word of God that has what they're going to believe. What's true or false. And, yeah, but and, the and, fact that you have a choice doesn't have anything to do with what's true or false. Like, yes, so it, is it cons- like if so if we all just have a consensus that two plus two is five, does it make it five? Okay, I love that. That was actually something I had written down. That there is an absolute, and that's the word of God. It's an absolute. And okay, but he, at, at no at, point at, have you demonstrated that you have the correct word of God. You just asserted it. Again, I, I believe that God. It doesn't yeah. matter what you believe. It's okay. whether you can prove that or not. I, I can prove that God used the the King James version to bless. The, the you didn't prove the, that. You just through, stated and the that British many, many times. And the, and the, the Americans. The I, 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 I see people getting saved in the Americas. I don't see people getting saved in the same way yeah, and but revival it's not saved going on. If your position over, is wrong. If you're heterodox, they're not saved. You're just teaching heresy. Well, I, I believe that, I, and I explained this earlier, I gave the gospel uh, through repentance in, of our sins None and faith in the Lord is, Jesus so Christ, not through liturgy, right. so not look, through I'm baptism, not, not, not through... The, okay, again, uh, I'm not gonna. Is, these are just fallacies. So, so the, the fact that you think that's the gospel doesn't have anything to do with what the canon of scripture is and proving that in an objective way. Well, I'm I'm basing it on the word of God, as I understand it. And, what and the I word believe, of God and, is and, and, is the thing in question. So every time you restate that you're just following the word of God, you are begging the question because the word of God, in terms of its contents, is the thing that is in question. Do you not understand that? Okay, I, I I don't think that again you you have arbitrarily chosen which set which tradition which church you're going to be a part I'm of. Happy to go into you, the reasons you, as to why Orthodoxy you, is true in Rome. Again, not, you, not you but that that's your decision, and it's not you, a but decision. You, it's, it's a decision it's, based on arguments it, and proofs. You it, it's a decision. It's a decision that you may. I, so, I, I when you when can't, you don't. So if I de- I might decide to believe that two plus two is four, and I might decide to believe that two plus two is five. The fact that I decide things doesn't make the truth relative. And you are arguing that people making decisions and disagreeing, it sounds like, makes truth relative. That's absurd. Truth is not relative. Truth okay, is not then, relative. Then the word of God is, is absolute. Is relative. The root word of God is absolute. That's why Paul said, "Reprove, rebuke, exhort with okay, all long I, suffering." And doctrine. I don't know what else to say. I mean, this is the most obtuse uh, debate I've had in a long time, and I don't mean to be rude to you, but like these are very simple points, and I can't. If you can't understand how these are fallacies, I don't know what else I can tell you. Well, it sounds to me like you have uh, you have lifted a church uh, into a, a a place of this is all again, worship. This is an either or fallacy. So the fact that I chose a church, right, as if I'm not choosing the Bible, that's your false either church or is not the, Church is not that important that it can so who does, who does Paul say is the pillar Does Paul say the Bible is the pillar and ground of truth or the church? The church is the distributor of the truth. We no, stand for the word of God. Who does Paul say to Timothy is the pillar and ground of truth? It's it's the church, but it is but not, not, but not, according to not you. necessarily your church, you see. Or not, yeah, well, and not necessarily my church. My, I, yeah, but in your got, argument, in your argument, it's not a church at all. It's the it's the text. Why doesn't Paul say that the pillar and ground of truth is the written text? At that point, the Bible, the New Testament hadn't wasn't completed. Okay, who put the who put the Bible together? Again, uh, I, as I said, Council of Carthage was they got. I believe they got it right. I'm gonna I'm gonna accept what they said. And that is arbitrary uh, as well as as you well have as no reason to choose them other than that's the canon that you want. That's arbitrary. I, it's not the canon that I want. It's the canon that I received. It is, I believe it. You, God blessed it and, and, it. and authorized no, it as you're, his word. That's dishonest. You don't receive their canon. I believe it's the authorized. It's authorized by God. Yeah, but, the, but you're just asserting your position because that's the canon that you believe in. I, and, I, and I see you uh, arbitrarily choosing a church and lifting it up to a place that it doesn't belong. I gave you a whole opening statement as to why the Orthodox Church has the liturgical tradition that the apostles handed down and none of the other ones do. So if you want to talk about Roman Catholic stuff, I'm happy to argue that. We can prove that by going to the canons of the seven councils where they don't teach the papacy. Okay. The the, the, the Eastern churches uh, they're all they all have nuances of difference that's why they're diff- that's why they're not all one you know they're, 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 they there's there's different flavors the there's different flavors so they have disagreements so which one is right which one's right 
They disagree with I each other on, on small things. Well, the, the Orthodox churches don't disagree. If you're talking about the Coptics, that's a specific statement about uh, Christology that we, that we would have to go into. But you keep under, not understanding that this is a fallacy. The fact that people disagree has nothing to do with what's true or false. Yeah, but so you, Do you not understand again, why that's a fallacy? Look, there, there are thousands, as you just said, there are thousands of denominations. Correct. I believe you have arbitrarily chosen one. It's not arbitrary because I'm happy it's, to give you the reasons why the Orthodox Church is the right. Okay, you can give me all kind of reasons, but they're, it's arbitrary for you, and you're doing so it because you just you, shot yourself in the foot because that's that's relativism. So you are a boomer who, on the one hand, says there's absolute truth, but then everything else is relative when it challenges your position. So you're inconsistent. Okay, I'm sticking with the Word of God. The, that's it's not actually the Word of God. It's just what you want, and so the definition of heresy is to pick and choose. And you do the very thing that you're saying, right, that I'm saying is, is what heresy is. You pick and choose. I want Carthage because it has this. I don't want anything else Carthage has. That's picking and choosing. And according to Paul, to pick and choose is the definition of heresy. Well, churches go awry. Churches go astray. Leaders go astray. Leaders get corrupted. Teachers get corrupted. Doctrine gets corrupted. And if you're going to put all your, all your eggs Carthage in the— not corrupted? If, it, and if you're going to put all your eggs in a church, if all you're going to put all your faith in a church, so all you've done I believe you could be led astray. Your, your own understanding. That's all you've done. I, I'm I'm taking the word of God as I believe God. It's has not the word it of down. God. It's your own mental conception that you're following. Okay, I, I I I'm going to take these 66 books. If you want to call it so arbitrary, again, that's just, fine. I don't know what else I can say. I mean, this is just a repeating like a yeah, boomer you, chasing his tail. So I don't know what else. To yeah, say. you're not gonna you're not gonna so, dissuade me from the 66 books. That I have no, because here. you're not I, I, able to argue and you don't even understand what a fallacy is. I mean, you consistently make fallacies throughout this discussion. And when I explain to you that it's a fallacy, you can't even recognize that it's a, do you know what a logical fallacy is? doesn't matter. I, I, I'm not going to okay, lift logical a church fallacies up. Logical fallacies don't matter. I'm not going to lift. Uh, okay. I'm not going to lift a church up above the word of God. Can't, can't do it. So I did, I did have one maybe possible direction we could take this before we wrapped it up. If you guys will humor me briefly. Um, <clears throat> Sola Scriptura or the belief itself that um, the Bible alone is enough, that there's no, there's no church authority, there's none of this type of thing. I, I asked this to a person one time when it came to interpretation, for instance, if I was blind and I couldn't so read. I, I want mm -hmm. to, to note that he said, logical fallacies don't matter. <laughs> Quote, that's, that's the surrendering of the debate. I would just want that on record. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> no problem. So um, I, asked, I asked a guy one time, if you couldn't read and somebody else had to read the scripture for you, isn't somebody else interpreting it for you? So it wouldn't be sola scriptura in and of itself? Would not be your own interpretation as somebody else is doing the interpretation? Uh, to read the Bible, you're, you're calling that interpreting? No, well, I'm saying if somebody else has to read it for you. Again, if, if someone is reading out loud the Word of God to you, I don't call that interpreting. Well, I mean, but you're interpreting it based on what somebody else says. You're not reading it for yourself, right? I, like, how you would know, you know? How would you know if they were lying, for instance? Well, look, uh, I, I, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall teach these to your children. Hear. It, the, the primary thing is for, for, to hear the Word of God, not, not necessarily to read it, but to hear it. To hear it with your ears, to hear it with your heart, to hear it with your mind. So to, to, for someone to read the Word of God to you is not uh, interpreting the Word of God. It's just to hear it, to, so you can hear it. And with your ears as opposed to seeing it with your eyes that's all it's just another gateway <clears throat> did you make a mind. did you make a choice at some point in your life to believe this or that bible no i i grew up with never the king made a james choice. I, well i grew up with the king james did you make and, a choice are you choosing to to follow and use the king james i, I don't use the king james today okay i use a, whatever a, bible a, you use did you choose it? i I, I, there were really no other Bibles when I was a boy. You know, whatever Bible you use, seventy you, years did ago, did you choose that? No, you, you didn't make it. Was a what was available? It was what was available. Are you con are you continuing today to choose whatever Bible that you use? I I, I use several different Bibles. So okay. You know, so I, when I, you wake up one morning and you choose a Bible to read, is that a choice you make? 
Yes, of course. Okay. By your logic earlier, that's an arbitrary choice that you made and you don't know that you have the right Bible. Well, I believe that there are, you know, different different types of translations. Some are wooden. Did you not some are, hear some the are, argument that I just made? I, I'm trying to explain. Some are wooden and some are conversational. And so sometimes I'm I want to- I'm making a logical point. You said sometimes that I, choices are arbitrary to you, and that means subjective. So you're confusing arbitrariness with subjectivity. Those are two different things, right? Sometimes I want a conversational Bible. Sometimes I okay, want so a wooden Bible. you're not even listening. You literally can't hear what- I answered what your argue. question. You're not answering the question because I'm making it very clear to you. Okay. So did you, so make, a, did you make a choice? Well, I, I've through the years, your as argument, I've studied the Bible, yes, I, are I make arbitrary. a choice. You said my choice of orthodoxy is arbitrary. That dumb argument falls back on you because every choice that you make would then be arbitrary and then everything would be subjective. Do you understand that that's a self-refuting position? Well, I, what I understand is that uh, in, You're not in, even listening. In, in my mind, I cannot place a church higher than the word of God. All right. Well, uh, gentlemen. I'm going to stop the debate there. I don't feel like we're making much in the way of progress. Are both of you guys okay with that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, gotcha. So callers, um, there's usually a little bit of overlap here. I'm gonna ask a couple questions myself. Callers can hop in if they want to. Jay, you got time for a couple of callers? Sure. Okay. And do you, Pastor P, have a couple of uh, sure. few minutes for callers? Okay, appreciate that. So uh, Pastor P, this, I think that this debate's been somewhat frustrating for the audience. Um, I take notes the entire time a debate's going on. I consider that to be a very important task for a moderator to do. But when we're talking about the contention of these arguments, um, Jay, Jay himself is, he's really just asking you why you believe this thing. Do you have a justification outside of, I just believe it? That's why. That's really what he's asking. And I said, First of all, I, I agree with the suppositions made at the Council of Carthage, the two primary suppositions that m define the canon uh, with these books. And then I, I believe God ble has blessed the Textus Receptus through the King James through the years. Yeah, and again, asserting a position isn't an, an argument. Right. It's, it's, so what, what you're doing is you, you're just kind of stating what you believe. Um, First caller in, Joel Olstein. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead with uh, with your question, sir. Yeah, I'm curious. When, when two people come and they both read the Bible and someone gets a different interpretation, how do you know who's correct and who's incorrect? And that's for um, Pastor P. What, I, what I'm hoping is that we can dig into the Word of God. We can take his whatever scriptures pertain to, to, to that doctrine, that, that thought that they have, and try to parse it out so that we come to a biblical understanding, a biblical position. Okay, um, I have a follow-up question for that because the, I think what Jay is trying to point out is that what's in question is what an actual biblical understanding is. So when we go and we say, we, we try to parse it out and come to a biblical understanding that's what's in question. That's what we're trying to find out. So we haven't found that yet, but we're trying to use that as our metric, as our ruler to say what a biblical understanding is. And that's, um, that's a, a very big problem. Well, I, 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 I try to be consistent as I study the Bible and teach the Bible. I try to be consistent with Old and New Testaments, putting stringing passages of scripture together, letting the Bible interpret itself and uh, stick with the word and, and let the word tell us what is the truth. Thy, Jesus said, thy word is truth. Okay, but if, so let's say, you know, I read the Bible and I came to the Eastern Orthodox Christian understanding, which is what I've done, and you've come to it and you've come to a different understanding, how do we know who's correct and who's incorrect? Well, as far as I'm concerned, we get into the word of God and the one that agrees most with the word is, the, is correct. But what we're judging, uh, what we're trying to judge, you know, correctness of the Bible with is our own interpretations. Well, again, uh, I've done my best through the years to let the Bible speak for, for itself and to be as consistent as I can with the doctrines, the teachings, and, and uh, let, it, let it interpret itself. And uh, for me, it's been a way of life. 
Well, and I don't, I would never disagree that you've done your best and that um, you've tried to make it a way of life, but the Orthodox Church has done the same thing, but we've done it for 2,000 years. So I'm, I just, I'm trying to point out, and then I'll get off the call. I'm sure we have other callers. Um, I'm trying to point out that by the standard. You can, uh, you can take your day, time. You can take your time here, caller. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take my time then. Um, what I'm trying to point out is that by the standard that you're laying forth, you would have to accept that we are also correct. If, you, if you're studying the Word of God and doing your best to interpret the Word of God, you know, I'll give you, I'll give, uh, I'll give you credit that we may end up coming to the same conclusions. You know, you, if a person comes with a quest, a biblical question, if you're squaring it with the word of God, then we may end up with the same answer. And if we don't end up with the same answer and like, like you and Jay and, and me and you haven't come up with the same answer, though, obviously, you know, I agree that you're sincere and of course would never doubt that you know you've studied so have i so has jay for his whole life and we've come to different conclusions so now what do we do to parse out who is correct and who is incorrect well we may have to agree to disagree but we can still have fellowship around the the, the lord jesus christ and his holy spirit we do you do you agree that with the gospel that i gave that jesus died paid for our sins and we must repent and believe in him. Do you agree with that? There's a lot to unpack there. I can agree with the words, but I may not agree with the concepts tied up with that. So for instance, when you say he died for our sins, do you think that um, that means that Jesus was punished on the cross in, in, in place of us? Yes. That's How part can of one person of the Trinity be punished by another person of the Holy Trinity? Well, <laughs> the Father chose to place this our sins upon him and he took he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him so he took our 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 pain our shame our punishment our guilt he took it all and he drank the cup to the bitter dregs and he he took my place on the cross so that I could receive the grace of God uh, because of his death for me and the blood that was shed for me and the price that was paid today, I can receive it for myself. Well, there, <clears throat> there's a rapper, Master P. Is that where Pastor P comes from? Was it a playing on the name of a rapper? No, no, no. I've been Pastor P for many, many, many years. Well, he's probably 35 <laughs> or 40, so. Well, I'm almost 70, so oh. no, it's not a play. I've been, I've maybe always you got, you, maybe you I've been, for 70. Maybe he got master P from pastor P actually. I I've been, well, maybe, but I've been pastor P for, for 50 years. So, yeah. Well, pastor P you look, I hope I look as good as you look when I'm, when I'm 70. <laughs> well, I, I play basketball um, twice a week and God has been good to me. I, I still work a full-time job and God's been good to me. Very cool. I, I, if I, if I have time for one more question, um, I'd like to um, bring up the fact that if, if Christ literally took on, became guilty, right? How is, um, then that would mean that, that God, who in essence is goodness and can't perform evil and can't perform bad, he took on a change in his essence and became, um, you know, separated from the rest of the Holy Trinity. So I'm curious as to yes. how you can reconcile yes, that exactly. with your interpretation. Yes, that perfect. Yes, exactly. Uh, it, that's why Jesus said on the cross, uh, well, well, first of all, let's go back to the garden. He said, you know, if there's any other way, uh, Father, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And then he, he turned to Peter. He said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. He was already feeling the pain, the shame, the guilt, the, the grief for our sin. And then on the cross, he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? The father forsook his son, and uh, it was it, it was dark for the space of an hour, because it, it, it was a picture of the father turning his back on his son, uh, at, at, in my place, uh, to taking taking my place on the cross. And uh, maybe Jay, can you give the Orthodox interpretation of the Garden of Gethsemane, um, if you would? Yeah. So the Orthodox view is that 
<clears throat> death in terms of the son of God undergoing death is the severance of his human soul from his human body. Given the fact that he's a, a divine person, he's identical to the logos. He is the second person of the Godhead. There's no way that the Trinity can split itself or damn one of the persons or something like this. It's absolutely impossible. So that would lead to either Nestorianism or some form of Arianism. Uh, the death of Christ is the severance of his human soul from his human body and his descent into Hades, which David describes in many, many, many Psalms <clears throat> going into Hades. And Peter says that the gospel was preached to the dead in Hades, known in Orthodox theology as the harrowing of Hades. And then we have the ascent of Christ in our nature to cleanse the way so that we can go into the hell, Holy of Holies in heaven, which is the third heavens, uh, which is the meaning of the Day of Atonement, according to Hebrews. So that's that's our understanding of that. Awesome. And uh, should I get out of here, Andrew? Or uh, maybe have a Yeah, we do. We do have a caller behind you. Cool. Appreciate you calling in Thank so you. much. Bye. Mr. Osteen, have a great day. Uh, <laughs> Jay, Jay Lewis, go ahead. Hey, um, so I had a question for uh, <clears throat> Pastor P. Uh, you you appealed to the Council of Carthage, I believe, um, and said that you agree with the uh, 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 presuppositions that they had there. But a lot of the people that attended that council also believed fundamentally in um, the authority of the councils and the authority of the bishops to come to conclusions on things. So how do you how do you determine which things that they uh, they got right in that council and what things they got um, that they maybe weren't right? Or how do you determine uh, <clears throat> the validity of what they're saying um, when they believed a contradictory thing that you believe? Well, uh, may, maybe what I'm saying is sub subjective, and I and, and uh, so be it. But uh, I believe that God has blessed the, their decision to choose the books that are in the New Testament canon over and over and over. He has blessed those books, and that's okay. the books that that's the books we have today. Then, then how comes other? Uh, how come those same bishops accepted um, different canons from the other councils then later on? Well, they didn't. They didn't elevate those canons to the, the same authority as the as the the what was agreed to on as the New Testament. They're not. They're not at the same level. How do you How do you come to that conclusion? Well, if you look at a Greek Orthodox Bible, Eastern Orthodox Bible, it doesn't have a thousand books in it. You know, it's well, it's, yeah, it's yes, limited. But it's limited. They have more than you do, right? You have your sixty six books, but the uh, the they have Greek the Apocrypha. But the Apocrypha is Jewish. Has different. Well, the Apocrypha is Jewish. Septuagint, Septuagint is Jewish. Okay, that's so. So they they're but they're not bringing in every deuterocanonical book uh, in in their Bible. Their their Bible is basically the same as mine. And and you add the apocryphal books. Well, as to well be as clear, the deuterocanon some... is the books that are called the Apocrypha, which are in the canon. So okay, well, that, that is that, part of our Bible. They're all Jewish. You know, they, that's where Maccabees and Bell and the Dragon and yeah. so forth are. And, uh, th and th it, that's that's all Jewish. That, I'm that not had nothing 100 percent sure about the the maybe Jay can answer this because I uh, uh, I'm not as well informed on this. But doesn't Christ and the apostles throughout the New Testament reference books that are not in the canon? Yeah. Yeah. I cited it in my opening statement. OK. So that, that's that's all I had. Um, I just wanted to say that it seems, uh, uh, Pastor P, that if the New Testament is referencing and the uh, uh, they're referencing books that your canon doesn't have, doesn't that pose a major issue for you? And that's just kind of one I want to leave. Maybe you can answer that and go back and forth with Jay on a little bit. On. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay, we got to get to our next caller here. Significo, can you hear me okay? Yes, can you hear me? I can. Go ahead with your question, sir. Hey, Crucible Crew. Uh, appreciate the show. First question's for Andrew. Andrew, you're smoking. You got that going. When are you going to... Can I buy you a Zippo lighter? Because that Bic is gay. Can I buy you a Zippo and send it to you? You can. You, you can. But, you but, only, but only if you put something awesome on it, right? <laughs> so I'll, 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 get, I'll get with you on Telegram. All right, all right. <laughs> so um, question or conversation or whatever for Jay. Jay, much love to you. I love your debates. I love watching you, uh, especially against atheists and other religions and whatnot. 
I um, I'm not an Orthodox, but I'm nowhere close to even being close to debating you. I'm going to let you know. So I'm really more kind of trying to pick your brain. <clears throat> what I hear a lot of, um, a lot of Orthodox people say, one of their, I don't know if you want to call it a gotcha or what, but they say, actually one of the callers brought it up. So what happens when two people disagree on a verse? I don't see that as being very much of a problem. I believe you're coming from the position that if there's a disagreement, it's whatever the church says, right? You go with what the church says. Are you asking me how does an Orthodox yes. person determine the disagreements? Yeah, you would default to what the church says, right? I'll just go into my question. Well, my question I mean, is, it's also it's also a question of the nature of, of the disagreement. I mean, we don't think everything is, uh, you know, encompassed in dogma. We think there are certain doctrines that are way more important than others. For example, the Trinity and the deity of Christ are absolutely sure. central to all of orthodoxy. So, for example... Um, we can't like have theologumina uh, on those, but uh, you know what a specific text in the book of I don't know, song of song, a song of songs means. Can there be varying interpretations of that? Sure, because that's not <clears throat> directly affecting the fundamentals of the faith, which would be things like you know what are outlined in the Nicene Creed, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I think you kind of uh, got to sort of what my question is. I was going to ask you about when um, you know Paul writes, you know, uh, he he has disagreements and he discusses how to handle disagreements and things like that. And if there was a central authority that was under direct inspiration from God in the same way that the writers of the original Bible were, why would he ever, you know, make allowance for disagreements if someone's going to have the answer, whoever the current leader of the Orthodox church would have that answer. Right. So every position uh, will struggle with people having arg dis uh, arguments and disagreements. So this is not something that's a unique feature of orthodoxy. Every group uh, has people who disagree, but that's a separate question from whether there's objective truth and who is in fact correct and who's in fact wrong. So these are all different questions. So um, we would say that, you know, in, in, uh, in Acts 2 at Pentecost, the spirit comes in fulfillment of what Jesus promised in John 14, 15, 16, 17, that the spirit would be the one that guides the church into all truth and that it would not leave the church. So there's a mystery between <clears throat> human free will and synergy and the guidance of the church. And for the Orthodox, we, sorry, go ahead. for the Orthodox, we would say that uh, <clears throat> even despite human weakness, there's still a providential guidance uh, for the church. And so, for example, as, Pastor P would believe that the that divine providence guides the inspiration and preservation of the text. I would agree with him, but where I disagree is that he wants that to be apart from uh, human uh, instruments within history. I'm just simply admitting that, no, there are human instruments within history. And in fact, we can identify who that body of people is as the instrument within history. It's not a vacuum where it's just me and the Bible. It's actually a historical process of a church that has existed in every generation. So, for example, you can go to Ephesus and you can find that church that Paul was writing those letters to. There's an Orthodox church in Ephesus. It's the exact same church. That doesn't mean that every Orthodox church always preserves it. People can fall away. People can go off into heresies. They can apostatize. Uh, you have in Apocalypse 2 and 3, Jesus says, if you keep doing this, I will remove your lampstand. Right. So there's the possibility of being grafted out. Paul warns the church of Rome in Romans 11. That they could be grafted out if they keep teaching or falling into error or heresy. So... <laughs> <clears throat> the question of authority in the Orthodox Church usually comes down to the local bishop. There's nobody higher than a local bishop. There's no uh, pope. It doesn't mean the local bishop is, a, is infallible, <clears throat> but <clears throat> the local bishop is the highest local authority, and the, the bishops meet in synods. In the history of the church, even before the Council of Nicaea, the normative structure and, and government of the church is local synods. The Orthodox Church still operates that way. It still operates on the basis of <clears throat> local synodal government. So what threshold would um, an Orthodox leader need to cross in order to become heretical? And therefore, this person's no longer the ultimate authority of God on earth. Move on to the next guy. Yeah, so, I mean, you have countless examples in church history of bishops who have fallen into heresy. And uh, that decision is typically made by their local synod. So is, is it that if it conflicts with the already existing scripture or is it, if, if all due respect, or is it just some other... Orthodox leader says this guy's lost his mind. No, it's it's a question. So we have a thing called canon law, right? This is the this is the hi history of Western Christendom has even the West has canon law, and so go read the councils and read the canons of Nicaea, for example, and you'll see the first example of canon law. 
There's also the apostolic canons, right? So <clears throat> it's a decision that's made by a synod looking at church law, ecclesiastical law, which we think Christ gave the power to the church to do that. In Matthew 16, he says the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. And he says that the church has the office of the keys, Matthew 16, as well as two chapters later to Matthew 18. So the same thing that's said to Peter about the keys in Matthew 16 is also stated to the whole college of the apostles in Matthew 18. Jesus also breathes on the apostles and says, whoever sins you remit, they remitted. Whoever sins you retain, they retain. So for us, all of those functions are part of the apostolic ministry. Jesus says to the apostles, he who hears you, hears me. Paul passes on that authority to Timothy in Ephesus as his only representative example in Ephesus. So <clears throat> there's no, there's not like a one size fits all answer. Like, like the Roman Catholics, Oh, the Pope decides all these things. Well, in the history of the church, the Pope didn't decide all these things. It was the decision of the synod basing itself on what had been received and passed down in the councils and in the canons. So in other words, let's say uh, we're at the council of Ephesus and St. Cyril is condemning Nestorius. What's the basis for Nestorius being condemned? Because Nestorius was the highest patriarch in all of Eastern Christianity. He was the patriarch of Constantinople. And yet he was started, he started teaching <clears throat> this idea that there was a dual subject in Christ, the eternal logos and the subject of the historical person, Jesus of Nazareth. This is condemned by Ephesus. Ephesus says, we don't see this in the scriptures. We don't see this in the teachings of the fathers, and we don't see it in the teachings of the canons, which have been received from the previous councils. So that's the modus operandi of the councils when they condemn bishops of Paul into heresy. <clears throat> yeah, I appreciate your response. Man. Yeah, we, caller, I'm, I'm afraid we have to move on to some other callers. We only have so much dire voice to go around tonight, I'm afraid. But I did hear the Zippo click, so that was good. Uh, <laughs> a wonderful evening. Appreciate it very much. Bible believer, go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes, can you hear me? Uh, we can. You're a little bit low. Okay. Uh, so maybe uh, speak up. Use uh, use yeah. the big boy voice, right? Go okay. ahead. Okay, I will use my big boy voice. Can you hear? Okay. Yeah. So, Pastor P, um, you said uh, modern Judaism doesn't have a liturgy, but Second Temple Judaism, where Christ would have worshipped, does not resemble modern Judaism by modern Judaism's own admission. So I just wanted to clarify that. I, I'm not sure I said that Judaism doesn't have a liturgy. I'm, I'm saying that the liturgy that I've seen in synagogues, and I've been to numerous synagogues, I don't see anything quite like it in, okay. in churches. So I, right. I, I, he, I thought he was saying that uh, the liturgy that, that uh, had was in the synagogues was being uh repeated in the church and i haven't seen that Did so I misunderstand I, no that makes no, sense what i was saying was that the <clears throat> uh if you read liturgical scholars from various traditions including roman catholic anglican and orthodox and perhaps even other uh protestant scholars what and even lutherans what you would have is the admission that in the early church the worship service that the church is doing in the first and second century arises out of a combination of the liturgical worship of the temple and the synagogue. I'm not saying that today's synagogue worship is identical to what the apostles are doing. Okay, that was just a point of clarification. But I wanted to ask you, Pastor P, um, is everything that you believe today a product of your own right to private judgment, sola scriptura? everything you believe about the Bible? Well, I've been under the teaching of other Bible teachers um, for my whole my whole life. It's not my own, it's not just my study, but the study of other men and women of God that uh, in, inform me and help me get a fuller teaching. So uh, I haven't come to all these conclusions myself. I will say though that I get up every morning and I spend uh, four, uh, about four hours in the Word okay. every morning. I don't want to take up too much time. That I, I'll, I'll just cut you off, and I just wanted to know, like you know, that you do acknowledge other people are you're gleaming information from other people within your tradition, um, and so I, I just wanted to ask you: are, Is the list of books infallible? I believe it is. So. Um, there's something outside of the Bible that's infallible? 
I'm sorry. What what books are you talking about? Are you talking the, about the, the sixty six the sixty six books? books? I believe that that's that's infallible. I, okay. I, so I, I'm sorry. I, so you're, you're saying that you're saying that the Council of Carthage was infallible in that case? In that case, yes. Okay. okay so sola scriptura is not what you believe then. Then yeah. you do believe so you in... believe in infallible authorities outside of the the Bible. Well, the books were there. They just had to be confirmed. That's it. They were there, uh, and God confirmed them. Did the early and, church ever operate without a definite canon, and for how long? Yeah, I, that is a. There were other. There were lots of things that. That's the whole reason, as I understand it, why the council had to be had to deal with it because there were so many books, so many books. Uh, yeah. They and and we now call those other books pseudo canonical. So. Uh, are extra canonical, but they had to decide what what is the word of God, and right. and uh, I believe God gave them wisdom in that in that regard. Okay, it's pretty interesting. Just a, a thought, then I'll leave. Um, that the doctrine of the Trinity and you know Christology was ingrained prior to a canon, and the church somehow you can trust the church in Trinity Christology and a canon, but you uh, somehow don't think simple matters like having a priest is something that the church can come to truth on. But uh, correct. Correct. Okay. That, yeah. just, that's interesting. Yep. Don't believe in priests. No. All right. Um, All right. Uh, thank yeah, you I'll so much, Bible Sorry. believer. Have yourself a great night. We've got a couple more callers past this. I would, can I add something on that point? Of course. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> if you look up the Dura Europa Synagogue, which is an early synagogue, it's actually mentioned uh, in the Orthodox liturgy book by, <clears throat> I think it's Oxford, Oxford book, but Hugh Wybrew is the author. Um, and he's a Protestant scholar at Oxford, and he traces the history of liturgical worship um, to the apostolic era. And one of the things he mentions is the uh, Jewish, the famous uh, synagogue called Dura, Dura Europa Synagogue. And I think it's from the second or third century. If you look this synagogue up, you'll notice that it looks just like an Orthodox church. It has icons and uh, all over the walls. <clears throat> That's all. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that. Bible believer, can you hear me okay? Bible believer, can you I think hear it was me? Solomon? I think you were bringing Solomon oh, on. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Solomon, can you hear me okay? Solomon, your uh, your mic is muted. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, go ahead with your question, sir. Okay, so uh, to preface, I'm not I'm not versed in debate and logic and uh, history like Jay or Pastor P, but I, I think I could see the problem in this debate why it's not moving forward and I think the main question that needs to be answered for Pastor P is what is the word of God and why do you believe that what you believe the word of God is to be instead of just saying <clears throat> instead of just saying I believe because on the other end Jay Dyer could say could say that as well and that's not a justification for that belief so what is the word of god and why do you believe that well first of all i accept the the bible that jesus used when he was on earth uh the the hebrew canon slash septuagint which was the hebrew canon translated into greek he quoted both so it seems and that was the those two were the foundation for the preaching of the apostle paul and so forth so that was accepted and uh, the apocrypha was there but it was not it had it did not have the same uh, uh importance and and uh, uh belief uh credulity that the rest of the old testament had the 39 books what we call the old testament and then i believe that god gave us the rest of the New Testament and can use the Council of Carthage and and the, and use the church to confirm his word. Uh, and so I have 66 books in in my Bible and uh, that's that's the word of God as I understand it. Okay. Um, Or do, do you not see that you ended it with, I believe that that's the word of God and that's what I understand because we're trying to, we're trying to find the, the objective, not the subjective, right? So if Jay Dyer were to, were to answer the question that I asked you, he will give you 
um, history and yeah, there's an objective public historical witness. Yeah, objective historical public witness as to what can and I accept. And as I and Solomon, as I told him, I've seen what I, through history. I believe I've seen God bless the those those books that were passed down through the Texas Receptus from the church. I, I totally acknowledge that. Uh, the Texas Receptus that, that Erasmus put together, Martin Luther translated into German, published through the Gutenberg uh, printing press, then and then uh, came to England. And in uh, uh, 1611, uh, King James had it translated uh, as an authorized. It had already been translated by Tyndale, but it was authorized and then allowed and 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 legally to to be printed and distributed. And I believe God has God blessed England and God blessed the, uh, the Americas with that book, with that Bible. Okay, again, you're saying I sir, believe. Sir, Solomon, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to cut you off, but we do have other callers that are right behind you. I gave you kind of two questions. Um, so I, I got to kind of move on to the other callers, but I do appreciate the call in, sir. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Uh, Jesus Brea, can you hear me Hello. okay? Yeah, can you hear me? I can. Go ahead with your question, sir. Thank you, Andre. Uh, I have a question for Master, sorry, <laughs> Pastor P. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. That was uh, unintentional. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask, um, I mean, up to the time of Carthage, right? Uh, you, from the time of the apostles, uh, Peter, Peter died, Paul died. Uh, we had Christians up to that time. Uh, then John died, right? Right. Um, up to the time of Carthage, what happened to all those Christians that didn't have a fixed, well, to, uh, according to your criteria, a fixed canon of scripture? Uh, what what happened to them exactly? How, how, what 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 was, what was their their uh, basically? Um, yeah, what, what what was sort of their faith? Their fate. Sorry. I believe it was in the, 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 the death of Christ. They believe the same gospel. There's only one gospel, and that is that Jesus died for our sins, and we repent of our sins and believe in him. And, mm -hmm. uh, the, and, and whether they had the full canon or not, uh, hopefully they were able to hear the word of God, the, of the, the word of the gospel, which is the core yeah. uh, teaching of the Bible. <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, uh, and... but... Go ahead. No, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, my follow-up is, uh, well, many Christians up to that time, and basically since um, the first, second century, uh, believed in things like the Eucharist, like uh, the priesthood, like, uh, you know, hierarchy. Uh, well, the teaching about the Eucharist was basically everywhere, right? And uh, you had many canons such as the, you know, you had collections that like the, uh, I believe the Muratorium canon, the, the the codex, the Vaticanus, uh, if I recall, uh, you had, I mean, you had a plethora of different canons, and uh, you know, up to that point, there was no uh, basically a fixed uh, canon that could tell us which was right and which was wrong. So, uh, what happened to them? I mean, uh, did, did all those people that followed the wrong ca the wrong canon? Uh, fail somehow? No, because <laughs> the the Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, which are basically the same, they were influenced by Arminius and uh, they uh, it's still uh, overwhelmingly the same as the Texas Receptus. There, there's not that much of a difference yeah. that, that, that the gospel would not be clear. The gospel was clear one way or the other. Yeah, but you had churches like that, that accepted like uh, the Apocalypse of Peter or uh, the, the letters of St. Clement of Rome, for example. Uh, I believe uh, there was a, a I, I don't recall if uh, there was a letter. Well, there, there were various uh, books that uh, many, many churches uh, included in their canon. So, I mean, uh, there was no agreement, general agreement on which books belong there. And uh, up to the time of Marcion, I mean, there, there was not even discussion about that, right? So, so 
what happened there? I mean, was there like a gap between that time and the time of Carthage? Uh, that's what I want to know. Again, the, the, I believe the the primary thing, you know, from from uh, in answer to your question, the primary thing is the hearing of, of the of the gospel. That's primary, as I said, you know that that's the center of the word of God, and so uh, it's not a it's there's no issue in hearing the gospel. Uh, no matter which books are circling it around, the gospel is still the same. It, it doesn't change. Re the, the death of Christ for our sins, that, that doesn't change. I believe, though, that God needed to have a clarification of what exact books would be in the canon, and that's what the Council of Carthage was for. So I, I, I want to add to that you know, there's quite a few people in the chat uh, uh, who I would like if they want to i'd like them to call in because draconian methods and andy something like they seem to be really uh interested in what i'm talking about so why don't they just call in i'd be happy to address any of their questions if they want to call in yeah so just like to kind of add on to that like you know jump in the discord call in no one's gonna bite your head off hard <laughs> right don't be a bunch of weenies <laughs> about it just call in uh hey Seuss. I appreciate you. very much your call. Have a great day. Rambling man, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Th yeah, thanks so much for your patience. Go ahead with your question, sir. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Pastor P, um, I wanted to know, do you think uh, the heretics of history truly believed their heresy? Why wouldn't they? I mean, uh, are you saying that they were heretics so-called? They really weren't heretics? Well, no, I, I kind of want to press you on this idea that merely stating that you really believe something is any kind of justification, right? Indeed, the heretic can and has used your same uh, argument as to why something is correct. Well, sincerity doesn't necessarily validate what you believe. You know, you can believe that the earth is flat, and just because you're sincere about it doesn't make it flat, if that's what you mean. Yeah, so I, I'm trying to see how you think heresy is rooted out on your system, given that a heretic can make your exact argument. That you're you're saying that uh, I I'm saying that I believe this, therefore it must be true, and a heretic is on equal ground with me because he says he believes such and such. Well, but I mean, but, you'll, but, you'll do but, you'll do the additional move where you'll say. But the way we adjudicate a dispute between me and the heretic is we go back to the word and we just check the word and find out if it's consistent with the word. But indeed, the heretic can do the same thing and come to his heretic, you know, heretical conclusion. So I'm trying to see how outside of just saying, well, we agree to disagree. Let's go start our own churches. Um, how does some dispute resolution in your system? Well, I've been uh, I've been a Baptist for many years. And uh, within our Baptist churches, we uh, do our best to keep the doctrine pure and to, if, if there is heresy, we try to root it out, call it out, root it out. And uh, we, don't, we don't execute anybody, <laughs> but we do excommunicate people, obviously. And every church has that uh, right, I believe, to do that. Right. You're saying uh, the Baptist you... church excommunicates people? I've never yes. seen them back. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When has this sure. happened? Oh, lots, lots. Sure. Uh, we have people that are getting... I mean, I, I grew up my entire life in the Baptist church. I never saw anybody excommunicated. No, I've, I've seen it. I, I had a quick, plenty of quick, times. quick question on this note, Pastor P. If a person who's in a Baptist church does get excommunicated, what's stopping them from going the next town over to the other Baptist church and just going to that one? Well, hopefully the next pastor will have some integrity and he will say, where have you been? You know, what church have you been a member of? And they will say, you know, X, Y, Z Baptist Church or whatever, and they all he, he'll say, great. And then he'll call that pastor and say, um, I have one of your sheep over here, and um, they are potentially, uh, you know, wanting to join and become a part of our fellowship. Can you tell me something about them? Uh, is there anything that I need to know, or or do I? Is there something I need to know? And at that point, the pastor can say, well, yes, they were either heretical or immoral or something 
you know, or no, they're great people, and uh, you should you should welcome them and tell them we 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 uh, they have our blessing. So, but if the her the if the person's a heretic and was excommunicated, let's say, Base Moon makes a great point here and says, why wouldn't he just lie and say maybe I've never been to a church ever? That's possible. That's always possible. I, don't I mean, know. you know, don't the, you think we, that there's a, a well, well I mean, look, it's a good uh, idea that like you have one body of a church so that you don't you don't maybe run into that as much. Well, uh, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. I feel like churches have to be I mean, look in a court of law. You know, you, you raise your hand and you say, I solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. And if you lie, you know, uh, if you, that's between you and God. And if a person goes to the next church and says, no, I, I haven't been a part of a church and they lie, that's between them and God. I, we can't, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, thank you so much, Ramblin' Man, for the call in. Have a great night. Sarah Mer, can you hear me okay? Uh, no, I cannot. Give me one second here. Oh, dear. Um, give me one second. There we go. Check in, check in, test, test, test. Is that better? Yeah, well, we we can hear you yeah, fine. Can you can you hear us okay? Hello, Andrew. Hello, hello, Pastor. Can you can you, can you hear us, sir? Yeah, I can, can you hear? You. Can hear you. Okay, can you hear okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead with your question. Yeah. So I became a born again Christian simply through exposing myself to the Bible, a plethora of Bibles, because uh, I came to the Bible through. Uh, Linguistic interests. I, I was interested in linguistic and the history of language. And through studying the Bible, I became a born again Christian. Now, since then, I've been perusing the different denominations and uh, the three uh, main contenders, obviously, Protestantism, Catholicism and Orthodoxy. And uh, at the end of the day, I'm, uh, I remain uh, a reluctant Protestant. I'm uh, Catholic friendly and I'm uh, Orthodox curious. So I have a question to Mr. Dyer, uh, if I may. Um, what happened to the people in Western Europe who for the last thousand years uh, lived and died outside of the Orthodox Church? Right. So, I mean, I don't think we typically make judgments on individuals' personal destinies because God doesn't <clears throat> give us information about that. But uh, if so, if God has a, me, uh, uh, a means by which he can join people to the mystical body um, outside of what he's told us, that's uh, certainly within the power of God to do that. We see that with the thief on the cross, who, for example, would be with Christ uh, that day in paradise and yet <clears throat> was not given the sacrament of baptism. So it's certainly within the power of God to do these kinds of things. But what the destiny of people who, uh, you know, died in those cases is, we don't know. Uh, what we do know is that it's our job to tell people to become orthodox. And I think when you look at texts like uh, like Acts 8, 9, and then around 14 up through 18, you'll notice the pattern of the apostles is uh, to, when they find people who are disciples that had not been taught about the Spirit or were John's disciples and didn't have the full teaching or whoever, the, the approach is to typically bring them under the episcopate. That's our, that's our understanding of those texts. So uh our uh, view is, episcopate this is too big brain for me i mean uh, uh, you know i thought my well, english I mean, was pretty me, good a, and then i and then i come to well, and then i realized well, i need another decade i need another decade to improve my english so i can even understand <laughs> that's a great it's, word. A, it's so hyper intellectual you, it's it's kind of it's kind of pharisaical ceremony hang on hang on ceremony 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 let him finish and then he can ask a follow-up yeah so that's a word that's used in acts one right when judas <clears throat> dies it says let another take his episcopate it just means the seat of a bishop it just means this an overseer right so um it's not my fault that these are difficult questions and so to call me a pharisee because i'm giving you uh you know sort of a historical analysis and, a, and a, what i think is a fair answer i don't think that's fair to call me a pharisee for answering your question hey uh sarah Murray, i had a i had yeah. a quick question I, i'm just curious yeah, because I, you know, uh, I've wondered about this myself, but let me ask you the question back. What happened to all the people who weren't Protestants? Did they go to hell? Yeah, that's a good question. And I humbly, uh, you know, posit that I don't know. I don't that's think that's what, no, that's what, that's what, what I that's said. That's what Jay Dyer said. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm saying when I listen to Jay Dyer, I can't help but think that this is kind of pharisaical, isn't it? I mean, okay, uh, but, uh, is, uh, explain he just how said that the is. same thing, though. 
Yeah, that's. I just said the same thing. That's right. Okay, so you're a hypocrite. That's a Pharisee. So you're a Pharisee too, because Pharisees were hypocrites. <coughs> maybe, maybe. But uh, I, I'm not as learned. I'm not as learned as you. And you know, yeah. I've been subscribed so is to. Is that I've what been... made the? So is that what made the Pharisees Pharisees being learned, or was it because they were being hypocrites? I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. And and it's overwhelming. I mean, Jesus this whole subject this is hypocrite. overwhelming. So how how can well, how can regular? Not my fault. How, how, it's not I, my fault. I, never, I, I didn't say it's your fault. But I'm saying, well, how, how, can have how can you, you see now? I'm not allowed to finish. Now I'm not allowed to finish my. All right, all right, all right. Yeah. Sarah, Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, so when, so when the regular Joe and Jane, uh, you know, if they if they hear the word of God and if faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and then they're uh, exposed to this uh, practically infinite plethora of competing denominations, how it it, it seems literally impossible to, to get. So it can't be this hard. It can't be this hard. So it's it's almost like you wound up back at sola scriptura in, in the end, because as uh, Pastor P says, you peruse all of these denominations, and and if you scrutinize them uh, uh, enough, well, just, then you find out that they're all they're all they're all rotten. I just hear resentment in your voice, resentment, uh, as Nietzsche said. So okay. it's not my fault. It's not my fault that these are difficult questions, and being uh, learned doesn't make me a Pharisee. So. Yeah, but I, 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 I'm talking about the average J, uh, Joe and Jane. How are they supposed to make a decision? To whom, to whom much is given, much is required. Yeah, but not everyone is much given, right? Exactly. That's what that phrase means. Well, okay, so so it's actually then it's an advantage to be on, simple sir, sir, and to be and to be last, ignorant. I just want to let you know this is your last I mean, follow up. Paul says account. that we will be judged based on the light that we've been given, the degree of knowledge that we've been given. Jesus says the same right, thing. Right, so okay, Romans two. Right. It's, I mean, whatever. Right, okay. right. I mean, so you then you kind of. I, then I don't then know you. Then you then then you're kind of safe if you're kind of dim, right? Yeah, then whatever. You're, then you're safer. All right. All right. Yeah, right. Well, All right. Well, right. right. Whatever. All right. Okay. So no All answer. Right. No answer. Okay. No, I did have an well, answer. Well, I mean, yeah. so I, I do. I do still kind of have to ask this real quick though before you go, Sarah, because he gave you essentially the same answer that you gave him, which is that we can't know, and you're like, well, we can't know either. I don't understand how that's not an answer or if he's a Pharisee, how you you wouldn't be a Pharisee with the same answer. It's bizarre to me. Yeah, well, I'm, I don't claim to know. The, the, I don't claim to have the answers as Jay Dyer does. Jay Dyer gives out this uh, so you have a personal problem with me and I haven't done anything to you. No, I'm saying well, you're, coming why, off, you're coming off kind of Pharisee. Well, then why are, you a, why are you a Protestant if you claim that you don't have the answers? Yeah, because I don't know. Does Protestant is a claim of Protestantism that they don't okay. know? So, do you think that not knowing or claiming to not know makes you morally superior? In in no way, in no way. Well, then why are you acting so morally superior? Well, I'm not acting morally superior. Yeah, you are. I'm you call saying, me a Pharisee. No, no, no. I'm saying tonight. No, I'm. You're, I, now I, I you're just... now you're lying because you call me a Pharisee. No, I'm not lying. <laughs> you right, said right. you're morally superior I, I, because I'm, you don't know. I didn't know. say that you're a Pharisee either. Now yes, you, you did. Now you're lying no, you're again no, because no, no, you you're said misconstruing I was a what I said. No, I'm saying you're coming you up. You said I was a Pharisee. Pharisee now you're saying, no, I did not. No, you're I just did not. a liar. I said you're a I'm not, I'm not right, 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 dude. All right, all right, Sarah. Mer, I do appreciate the call in. I don't know. I've never been on the show before. No, no. The idea. irony is that that guy's approach is exactly the Talmudic approach of the Pharisees in the New Testament. The way they treat christ when they argue and try to trap christ and they try to be morally superior so the irony is that he's acting like he's morally superior because he's quote simple well, pastor p so let me let me ask you that question real quick before we get to the next caller because it seemed bizarre to me that a person would say i'm a protestant not an orthodox my issue with you is that you can't tell me what happened to people who were protestants but when that question's posed to him he couldn't either why is that not even ground? Why would it make one a Pharisee or not the others? It, it, he seemed to think just the claim of knowledge. It's bizarre. Well, I can't, I can't uh, read his mind, but I, I, I want to, I want to answer the question that he asked, and then, and then uh, maybe comment on his attitude. Uh, I, I believe that you know the Bible says you will seek me and find me if you search for me with all your heart, and. Uh, I believe that if a person wants to know God, that if they reach out to God sincerely, God will reach back to them and uh, and will somehow get the gospel to them, just like the Ethiopian eunuch in the out, out in the desert. And God picked up Philip from a, preaching a revival, so to speak, and dropped him in the middle of the desert so that he could give the gospel and then took him back. So God will bend over backwards 
to make sure that a person gets the gospel. Um, and if a person wants to hear the gospel, God will make sure that they get it. So, uh, you know, that's my answer to that one. I, I, I can only say that uh, our friend was uh, maybe put off with some, some uh, I don't know, high-mindedness that the Orthodox Church is the only church, very exclusive. So it does sound that way to me, and and that bothers him. Is, 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 am I missing a point? Am I missing that? Well, yeah, I guess I guess maybe to boil it down, like uh, let me just ask really directly: Do you think that Orthodox people and Catholic people are going to hell? Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Uh, many of them have listened well enough to understand that Jesus died for their sins, and they're sorry for their sins, and they they are they've come to an understanding of His sacrifice on the cross for us. Those people. Uh, I believe many of them are saved. I can't, you know, I, it, it was it was rare that I ran in, in all the, you know, many, many thousands of people that I've spoken with. It was rare that I ran across a Catholic that I would say, oh, I think they're saved because I believe salvation changes a life. And I didn't see a whole lot of changed lives there. I, I would like to invite Black Flame Nova and KL who are sort of going nuts in the chat to just please call <laughs> in and uh, you can say whatever you want and interact, but to accuse me of being a Pharisee and then turn around and say, I'm not calling you a Pharisee. I mean, just, just make your point and uh, you know, what, what does it, let me say this, like if you think that I mean or, or whatever you think I'm the worst person ever, none of that has anything to do with whether the positions are true or false. So yeah, I mean, we've had way meaner people on the Crucible than Jay Dyer's been today. Slobodan, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I can hear you guys great. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead with your question, sir. Awesome. So uh, my question is for Pastor P. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, uh, do you know that uh, given the biblical text that uh, people can come to any any huge variety of interpretations from that and do you consider like do you consider that some interpretations could be wrong or could be spiritually i, I don't mean wrong in in a factual sense but wrong in a spiritual sense I, do, you, do you believe that people can have an interpretation that's wrong in that sense i'm 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 sorry which are you talking about a specific passage that i referenced or are you talking about just in you know, biblical teaching in general just in general, like, uh, for example, you have some Gnostic sects that believe that Jesus is the same person as the serpent in the garden and that Jesus's role was to free us from the prison of Eden and that Jesus is actually a different entity from uh, God the Father. So do you, do you see how somebody without any teaching or extrapolation or interpretation given to them uh, from an authority how that can lead to a spiritually dangerous belief? Well, you know, God gave the church uh, what we what we call fivefold. <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the fivefold ministry: apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. A pest, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. And it's our job uh, to make sure that they are taught clear and correct doctrine. And uh, you know, somebody comes to the church uh, that I'm pastoring with with those kind of doctrines. I'm I'm going to sit down and try to show them what uh, the Bible says about it. Sir, how sir, can you... uh, Slobodan, I'm I'm really yeah. sorry. We have a bunch of callers stacked up behind you. We still have a couple more that we have to get to. I do appreciate your calling. Can you make this last question very concise? Yeah, sure. Um, so how do you how do you determine what is the correct interpret? How can how can you, for example, let's use that example. How can how do you tell that person that they're wrong? That if they believe that Jesus was a serpent in the garden and everything I just said, um, how can you tell them that they're wrong? Well, there there's no clear teaching that teaches that in the Bible. That so, you know, they're going to have a hard time having a, a good proof text for that. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you so much, Slobodan. I really appreciate the call in. I'm sorry that we have to move along quickly, but we want to get to everybody. Uh, DJ, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can. Can you guys hear me? Uh, yeah, speak in. Speak into your mic. Okay, is it better? Yeah, I'm getting a bit of an echo, uh, but I think it'll be okay. Go ahead with your question. Okay, uh, my question is for Pastor P. Um, I want to ask about the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. 
Um, I'm wondering if you think the ruling of that council was infallible, seeing how, you know, the council took place before it was ever written down in the scriptures. Well, we get a back behind the scenes look at that council in Galatians, where the Apostle Paul said he withstood Peter to the face for associating with the Judaizers, trying to, to de demand that in order to become a Christian, you had to be circumcised. And so the Apostle Paul was able to get in there and uh, sway the council, and thank God he did. Right, but uh, but do you would you say that the ruling of that council was infallible? Well, what what, what ruling are you talking about specifically? Uh, that that you don't have to be circumcised to uh, be saved. Again, I believe the apostle the God that God. Um, use the apostle paul to sway them and uh, that uh, we don't and then thank god we don't have to be circumcised which which is just another way of saying we don't have to be jewish that's really all that means is we don't have to be you don't have to be jewish to be saved you can be a gentile and be saved and i'm a gentile so uh i'm able to be saved right so so if that ruling was infallible why why would you say that the rulings of the other ecumenical councils like Nicaea and Constantinople one and all those weren't infallible well we, we again we people are 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 prone to error and i can't accept every time that uh, people get together that they're going to come out with the right answer uh dj i appreciate your call in and I uh, hope you got the answers that you were after. Thank you so much for that call and appreciate it very much. Still have a few callers left. Thank you uh, both the debaters for hanging out for the calls. A lot of people really wanted to talk to both of you. Um, Rachel, go ahead. Hi, can you guys hear me fine? Yeah. Hi, Pastor P. Um, I think that everyone in the chat really agrees that, you know, we find you to be a really sincere guy and it's very clear that you love Christ. So we all appreciate that. I just have one question. Um, we didn't have a Bible for the first few centuries of Christianity. Um, there, you know, people didn't have a Bible in their house. There was no printing press. There was no canon yet. Um, we just had various scriptures in various churches, but they hadn't been compiled into a Bible. Uh, yet those centuries produced some of the greatest martyrs in all of Christian history. How did those people know what Christianity was if it's Bible alone? Well, the the word of the of the gospel is the core, and I, I, I think I started out by saying that a couple hours ago. That the word of the gospel is the core of the Bible, and uh, if 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 a person heard the the core of the Bible, which being the gospel that Christ died for our sins, pay the price, and and they receive that. That's the primary thing. And you you know the 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 martyrs. That was what they were dying for. They were dying for the, for the for the gospel, for Christ, for their belief in Him. They weren't dying for every little right. little yeah. doctrinal belief. They were dying for that one thing. Right. But how did they know that? if they didn't have a Bible, right? It had to be a priest who told them they had to hear it in a church, right? Maybe. They, they I mean, might have heard it from an evangelist. They, they wouldn't have a Bible they could just read, right? So how would they, they know the gospel unless it was through oral teaching at that point? How shall we hear without a teacher? Yes, of course. It, it, it's it's through the church that God has, has given the, and primarily, I mean, sometimes it's not always a church. Sometimes uh, it's it's uh, a Bible in a you know, Gideon Bible in a motel drawer. Right. So you know. I, I understand. You have to make this scripture. last one really sure. concise, right? I will. I just have one point. So we can't. We all agree in the primacy of Scripture, but we cannot say Scripture alone based on what you just said. It God can't uses... possibly be Scripture alone if, for the first three centuries, we didn't have Scripture. That we could read so that's well, all i want to say okay did you want to respond to that pastor yes that, that there were texts that were passed all around uh they were and, and again that's part of the problem was that there were lots of texts being passed around uh they uh, for the most part they they were teaching that christ was the, the jewish messiah who came to die for sins and uh you know if a if a if a person only had a couple of manuscripts uh, that were from the New Testament, then 
that was a, probably enough to give them the truth of the gospel. Well, I, I'd like to comment on this as well, because <clears throat> if we go to St. Irenaeus, who was uh, a famous bishop in uh, 180 AD, <clears throat> and he has a book called Against Heresies. And if you read books three and four of Against, <clears throat> of Against Heresies, um, he actually helps us uh, answer this question. So particularly book three, he talks about at the very beginning, the, the first two chapters, he explains for the second century church what was normative, at least as far as he understood throughout the Roman Empire. The way that <clears throat> the true church was known was the tradition of the church. In this tradition, he, he identifies as apostolic succession. He says that this tradition that the church holds is not an, a secret oral teaching like the Gnostics had, but it is in fact the entire apostolic deposit, both written and oral tradition, which is had in the churches that possess the apostolic succession. So the very time period that we're referring to where there's not yet a canon of scripture, St. Irenaeus gives us multiple texts and passages at length describing the way that Christians knew the gospel and they knew the faith. And it's precisely the means that I describe uh, in the Orthodox position. Appreciate that very much, Jay. We're gonna move on to the next caller. Uh, got to kick a couple of these out of studio. I think that they just didn't disconnect correctly. Uh, proper Chals or proper Chadian. Sorry. Can you hear us? Okay. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead with your question, sir. Oh, it's Chadian, but anyways. Um, yep. Yeah. That's that's just for correcting me on my own show. You know, like don't. I'm I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. <laughs> Chads are always getting discriminated against, so I would have been surprised if you booted me for that. But uh, yeah, Pastor P, I appreciate you staying up late and talking with us here. I know uh, it's probably getting a little long in the tooth going into the whatever hour it is, but I had a question. If Are you familiar at all with Nestorianism, the heresy that plagued the early church? Not a lot. Okay. Um, so if, if I told you that your explanation of the Trinity is Nestorian, would that be something that would maybe be alarming or something that could possibly, if that was true, lead you to believe that, you know, the Baptist church has been spreading heresy? Well, I, I, for me, I square everything with the word of God. So if, if, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know enough about Nestorianism. I'm assuming that it's somehow dividing the nature of Christ uh, between his godhood and manhood and allowing one to become more important than the other. Yes. Um, well, so, I mean, there's a lot that goes into, it. I would just recommend maybe looking into some of the early church fathers that, you know, maybe even were directly discussing this exact issue because, um, you know, I think that the demons only have so many tricks up their sleeve and a lot of the heresies just get recycled and come back with, you know, a different paint job. And I know you're very devout and, you know, serious about your faith. And I, I think we can all respect that. Um, you know, I don't think you need a really in-depth, you know, theological understanding. I mean, you can be a simple person like the, the blind man that said, you know, who is the savior that I can believe and be saved. But um, we need to be careful if we're actually spreading something that has both this deep logical truth rooted in it that can be traced back to the apostles. And also, you know, it's one thing to understand that deeply. It's another to, you know, have the belief in the church that Jesus established and, you know, obviously do your due diligence. But, uh, you know, I think you said earlier that you believe that in subjectivity that there is, I mean, you would probably say there's absolute truth, but um, I, I mean, we all believe there is, but I would just encourage you to maybe look into, you know, the Nestorian controversy to, to see exactly what, you know, the dividing of, of the personhood into Jesus into both a divine person and a human person, and the human person gets damned, um, like the problems, because they weren't just a bunch of guys sitting in an ivory tower, like these things had real world ramifications that, you know, when permeated, you see the madness that is America with 30,000 denominations, you know, Baptist Church A with Pastor Billy Bob believes this, Baptist Church G B with, you know, Master P believes this and I'm right, he's right. <laughs> so my, my follow-up question, and, and I'll be sorry, Andrew, but so where what is the metric within the Baptist church to correct the original sin of pride? Because I don't see anything in every one of your responses is I believe X. And that's all well and good, but what if what you believe is wrong? Like where, 
where is the correcting factor that the historical church in historicity and the objective truth can provide an orthodox christian for looking in the mirror and realizing man i'm wrong whereas you know every baptist can just start their own baptist church b then i disagree with you on this then we start baptist church c and you know it's just endless splitting of the body of christ which again goes back to nestorianism that now we have multiple bodies of christ so sorry i'll let you respond to that well baptist churches uh, as i think i mentioned before we are all about bible studies and small groups and uh getting together constantly where you know we we a typical uh, a, a, a faithful baptist is in church five times a week <laughs> And so we rub shoulders, we talk, and if we're if there's heresy, it, it won't take long. It, it won't take more than a. In fact, people who have heresies typically uh, can't wait to tell everybody. So, uh, you know, you go to a Bible study and a person starts saying that they don't believe that Jesus is God or whatever, uh, then that's going to get called out, and uh, it's going to be you know somebody's going to deal with it. Uh, by the way, caller, I appreciate so much your call in. If you can still hear us, uh, proper Chadian, right? Or Chadian, however you pronounce it. Don't correct me. Lemon, you are <laughs> up. Go ahead with your question. You've been waiting very, very, very patiently. Uh, go ahead. Okay. So, I have a so, Jay, I just want to wish you a blessed fast. Um, my question actually is for Pastor P. Where was Jesus when he was three days in the tomb? Where was he? I believe he went down to Hades and proclaimed uh, liberty to the captives and and uh, led captivity captive. And uh, where is uh, this in, in Ephesians? And then uh, he, I, I believe it. I'm not. Sh I, I, typically, we Baptists we don't know for sure whether he waited to go back to his father uh, until after the resurrection or before. But uh, yet, you know, because uh, uh, one of the Marys grabbed him and he says, don't hold me. I have not yet ascended to my father, your father, and my God and your God. So uh, at some point he did go back to the father and uh, he, and at some point he did go down to Hades. We, you know, we say the Apostles' Creed uh, from the Council of Nicaea. Uh, typically Baptists don't recite the part that says he descended into hell. And uh, I, I was re reared in a Reformed church. We didn't say it either. But, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people, a lot of Baptists believe that he did. And it's it's about a 50-50 split amongst Baptists. I can't speak for the Reformed. I left the Reformed church long ago, so I can't speak for them. But lots of Baptists believe that, that that's what happened. Last follow-up, Lemon. Go ahead. The issue that... And the I would argue that the issue that the reason why it's a 50 50 split is because they don't hold the is because they don't hold the creed as authoritative, and that's a problem. Because without some form of holy tradition, your, your system just falls apart. I was a Protestant for 14 years, it just doesn't make sense. Um, Andrew, I just want to thank you, and everyone have a nice night. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the call in Lemon. We appreciate it very much. Did you want to speak to what he said there, Pastor Pete? Uh, I can't, I, 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 I can't disagree that, uh, there, there are churches don't always make the word of God clear and some churches, uh, veer off and uh, talk about social issues rather than the truth of the gospel and what Jesus came to do and uh, lose, they lose focus. I can't disagree with that. I appreciate that. Um, so I, I'm going to move into the super chat section, guys. Thank you so much for being troopers and hanging in there. We have a lot of people who have a lot of questions still. Uh, it doesn't surprise me a bit with uh, with kind of the way that this debate has gone. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm going to start with Dono Chat. Sent ethics, authoritarian, blah, 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 blah. Sorry, guys. I'm just finding my place to make sure I don't lose it. Okay, well, I, this four dollars from Terry said. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jay. I was just gonna say uh, <clears throat> I may have to uh, head out pretty soon, but um, I want to say that I uh, I thank you for doing it, Pastor P, and uh, you're a, a very uh, genuine genuine man. And uh, uh, we got heated, but I appreciate the good spirited approach uh, towards the end here. That uh, you know we can be friendly and on good terms. And uh, uh, you know I apologize if I got too heated for you, but uh, it was a good good uh, good discussion. 
Well, if you uh, if you do need to head out, I understand, Jay. We're going to fly through these Super Chats really quick. If you can give it just a few more minutes, if you don't Yeah, mind. I can hang out a few more minutes. Okay. And by the way, Jay Dyer, you can find him. We'll have his channel description up. He's terrible at Resident Evil. But other than that, he's pretty much a good guy. Pretty much. Hey, good that's guy. just the first one, man. I never played it. <laughs> just, that one was hard. For $4 from Terry, he says, Pastor P., you remind me of my grandpa. You rely heavily on social relativity, your truth or stories instead of objective truths, uh, typical boomer thought process, but God bless you, Pastor P. So he was kind of wrapping up the insults with a little bit of <laughs> you're also okay, right? So $10 from Black Ortho Acolyte. He says, Pastor P, do you believe the Council of Jerusalem was infallible and guided by the Holy Spirit? Could early Christians reject that council and still call themselves Christians? I do believe it was infallible, and I do believe that that God led them to to make Christianity uh, something that did not de demand circumcision, and and uh, the Judaizers were wrong, and the Apostle Paul at that from that time on, the Apostle Paul took the ascendancy in leadership, and I believe that was also something that was important in in the early church. $10 from Jay Ford. He said, would either of the debaters like to offer a quick word on kinism? What the hell is kinism? Anybody know what kinism is? I don't know. Uh, it's a, is. a variant within the students of Rush Uni. So, yeah. So, basically, it's like uh, Rush Uni's philosophy, theology with a kind of um, sort of racial approach, basically. Of course. Of course. Three dollars from the Palantir, great name, right? Or uh, Palant or Palantir. There we go. Lord of the Rings reference. Pastor P, if you don't mind sharing, which denomination of Protestantism do you follow? Why is this one right as opposed to others? Thank you. And I believe you said you were a Christian Reformed or Baptist, right? Well, uh, I, I was I was reared in a Reformed church. Uh, it was called Presbyterian, but you know they they follow the Reformed uh, doctrines and uh, became a fundamentalist independent Baptist for many, many years. And uh, uh, when I came back to Atlanta from New York City, uh, I decided to become a Southern Baptist. And of course, Southern Baptists have had their, their battles. Uh, so, you know, I, I am, uh, I'm, I'm a Southern Baptist now and uh, I'm not a pastor. I spend most of my time researching and writing so I'm not involved in active ministry at the moment. Uh, yeah. Okay. Appreciate that. $10 from No Limit Sur uh, Soldier. He says, Pastor P's lack of ar argumentation makes Jay say, uh, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> he, made, he made sure that he wanted to put the hyphen on that. So, <laughs> you know, I, I had to do it. Okay. Scott Morrissey for $4 says, first century Christians were saved through the preaching of the word of God by the Orthodox Church. Uh, I'm sorry, not by the Orthodox Church, but by reading the Bible. A lot never read the Bible. That's uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind of hard to do, and most people can't read. So, yeah, I mean, that's I mean, that's kind of a fair point, isn't it, Pastor P? That the preaching of uh, I'm not I'm not quite following. Uh, yes, the, you, you're only saved by the preaching of the Word of God, or by the by the hearing, or somehow understanding the Word of God. There is no other way. So I, I'm not quite sure what they're saying it, it's it, 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 church or no church god can get to you with his word if you're sincerely wanting to hear it i mean okay uh, one way or the other gotcha ten dollars from brooks says thank you for this debate we appreciate it three dollars from squid pastor p you believe in the canon you have now and carthage was right if you were alive during carthage how do you discern what was right if you had no word of god what would your normative authority be with no canon the Old Testament, as I said, there were two two primary rules in in selecting the the books that were going to be in the canon, and that was did it uh, was it did it square with the Old Testament perfectly? Didn't contradict any Old Testament scriptures, and then secondly, was it under the tutelage, the authority, I should say, of the uh, of of at least one apostle? Uh, you know, uh, did 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 Paul, Peter, someone have something to do with it? Like like the book of Mark probably was 
Peter's gospel, uh, and, and Luke was Paul's gospel. Um, so Paul watched over Luke, and Peter watched over Mark, and uh, therefore we have those two gospels. We was fishes, best name of the night. We was fishes. Sends in a dollar fifty one and says, Pastor P versus Young Boomer, the rap battle of the century. I think <laughs> that's coming. Well, Emmanuel sent in five dollars fifteen cents. Uh, he says, Elixapress PC Hackintosh Fund. Joking aside, it really is cheaper if you know how to build it and have the time. Appreciate that towards a computer fund. And or uh, NG Benji sends in seven fifty three. It says, Always glad to see Jay on this channel. I want to see him debate big name atheists like Cosmic Skeptic, Rationality Rules, Dan Barker, or Michael Shermer. Make it happen, Andrew. Okay, so I am working so, on the dire yeah. debates. The thing is, is tonight he's here because he was filling in, and I requested that <coughs> and he was a very good sport. So go ahead, Jay. Well, and I was going to say, you know, we've reached out to at least a couple of those people, and uh, they don't they don't reply. So Cosmic Skeptic has been asked many times. Um, so, but I'm always open if he's still if he wants to do that. I have been known as a miracle worker. We'll see what we can get done. I've, um, I think we'll get something done. Pano sends in a five dollar super chat. Orthodox channers are not supposed to read the Psalms hyper emotionally, as was demonstrated here by Pastor P. Oh, we are to keep a sober pace so as not to arouse passion. Oh. You must apologize for your offense immediately, Pastor. Wow, sorry, but uh, <laughs> when I read the Word of God, I get excited. Gotcha. Reverend Coffin's other son sent a $10 super chat and says, I'm looking into the local Greek, Greek Orthodox Church myself. Thanks for putting all this together, Crucible Crew. That's great to hear, by the way, Reverend, Co uh, Reverend Coffin's son. He's been a channel member. It's nice to see him going that route, finally. Uh, PP, that would be you, Pastor P., he, uh, Henry 2817 says, it's time to consider orthodoxy. Oh, what do you think? Probably not. Probably, probably not. not. Probably yeah. not. Sorry. But you've brought so many people he, to orthodoxy off just, <laughs> just this one debate. Just so you know, I'm kidding. I'm, ki I'm kidding. <laughs> Piebald says for $10, Pastor P, if Sola Scriptura is true, which of the many varying Protestant exegetes do I follow? The word of God equals perfect, but exegesis of men equals fallible. You ask which apostolic church yet offer no more clarity. Well, you better read the Bible for yourself first. And even though, you know, you you can also be fallible uh, in the multitude of counselors is great wisdom. And you read the word for yourself, ask the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom and understanding and guidance. And then you listen to others and God will help you. AJ sent in a five dollar super chat. Jay, even if you were being charitable by only using your left hand in a fight, punching an old man is still elderly abuse. Wow, that was. I didn't punch anybody, and I was just filling in. So <laughs> yeah, uh, Dell Bridge sent a ten dollar super chat. Can a person interrupt the Holy Bible in any way that they like if they believe God revealed what the Scripture meant to them? Some open and affirming churches make that assertion assertion i can think of one off the top of my head which is the mormons where a guy went out in the forest and looked into a little hat and right. picked what he liked and didn't like right right so i mean to answer to the question of can just anybody interpret that and exegete it and is that really correct without having some type of authority Are you asking me yeah okay yeah I, I i believe that you know the Mor the Mormons are a big problem for me because they uh, chose to accept a whole lot of non-canonical uh, books, uh, Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, Doctrines and Covenants, and then beyond that, the decisions of their elders, believing that their elders are able to give uh, absolute truth through their decisions, and, and it sounds kind of familiar, but... Uh, you know, I, to add, to, to, to take uh, all these books and add to what was already the canon of Scripture is, is a big problem because the, you, there's there's absolutely nothing uh, in the Scripture that, that can give us anything like the Book of Mormon. Gotcha. The wrath of Jay shall not be spared. Simply, he's not an ageist, ladies and gentlemen. Well, you know, like he's not an ageist. What a bunch of jerks. Terrence. Sends in a $5 super chat. Pastor P believes in social relativity instead of objective truth. 
He's like my grandpa. He just tells stories. But God bless you anyway, Pastor P, and we love you. Well, Emmanuel sends in a $5.15 super chat. Jay, it may be helpful to clarify the distinction on epistemic and normative authority. Maybe not, but worth a try. Yeah, so I think, so normativity <clears throat> refers to uh, ought uh, in the sense of, you know, we ought to hold this interpretation. Or is there a, <clears throat> a body of people that exist? Did Christ provide the church with any body of, uh, of people that have the ability or the authority to um, enact an excommunication or to enact a creed or to enact a, uh, <clears throat> a doctrine or canons that bind people. And of course, the Orthodox view is obviously, yes, the bishops have that authority. We think that is in the New Testament. Christ gave that authority. Um, and so the one of the problems in Protestantism is that <clears throat> we don't find this idea of normativity. There's no body of groups or, or people within history that ca that had the ability to bind anybody to anything, and so that's the the actual source of the the you know thirty thousand denominations or whatever in the West, um, and then that. But that's different from the individual for the notion of <clears throat> individual epistemic certitude. Everybody's in the same boat when it comes to how does an individual come to to know and to have certitude and whether we're Protestant or whether we're Roman Catholic or whether we're Orthodox, at the end of the day, all of us affirm that at the, at the final stage, it's the Holy Spirit that leads the individual to, to have certitude. Everybody professes that. But the question, in my view, that's distinct here is <clears throat> where we differ is the means. For the Protestant, it's the individual in the Bible. For the Roman Catholic, it's the individual and in the papal decrees. And for the Orthodox, <clears throat> it's the uh, Holy Spirit using the means of the church, fathers, liturgy the councils the lives of the saints all of that goes into how we know the truth know the canon and know the doctrines thank you so much for that we're not going to keep you much longer i promise we're almost done with the super chats tones terrific sent in a five dollar super chat this is not so much a discussion on religion or spirituality as it is an example of why baby boomers made no progress socially morally or spiritually <laughs> tim zimlick sent in a five dollar super says jay do you believe it's theoretically possible that there's even one teaching the Orthodox hold that isn't true, small or big. Uh, no, I think that this is part and parcel with the promise of the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John that comes at Pentecost and that the, the <clears throat> Holy Spirit has never left the Orthodox Church. And the way that I know that is that when I go back and I read these guys in the various centuries, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth century, they all teach the same thing that I believe. Gotcha. Casey Bear sent in $20 for the computer fund. Appreciate it so much, Casey. Wicked Wally sends in five bucks, says, did you hear the one about the ecumenical Navy? They always elevate their cannons. That was the worst dad joke I ever heard. You should be fired from existence for that. Piebald sent in a $5 super chat. P mentioned <clears throat> he didn't personally suss out every doctrine himself. He trusts others' use of SS alongside yours. You are not Sola Scriptura, faith in men. We've already been kind of over that ad nauseum. We do appreciate the super chat. Josh Zippo says, uh, PP, Pastor P, I want to see you restudy and come back again. We'd also like to see you come back again, Pastor P. We enjoyed it very much. Jason Schull sent in a $5 super, said, Sola Donatio, the crucible co continues on donations alone. Pony up some dough, some, uh, dough shekels, whatever you want to call them. George sent in five bucks. Pastor P, how would you interpret this is my body? Uh, fortunately, we're not going to be able to have time to get into that. Uh, anyone on the stream recommend a good Sola Scriptura debate? Jay, can you recommend a good one that you would uh, toss out? I mean, uh, you know, we had one on your channel with Pedro. Yeah, that was good. That was on your channel, actually. Oh, my, my bad. Yeah, yeah, that was done specifically. It was a dire exclusive uh, Black Flame Nova sent in 10 said video game donkey puts it. I'm right. You're wrong. I win. You lose. Bye bye. Then you shout, put your fingers on in your ears. Ultimate debate strategy. I enjoyed this debate very much. So enjoy some donation. Appreciate that. Ten dollars from Jake for Andrew's new MacBook. Don't stop the theology debates. Also would love to see kale or vegan gains. On to debate. We have a bunch of debate announcements. Don't go anywhere after the show. Circle G sent in two bucks. Baptists don't have check. Dr. Greg Boyd. Jim Bob sent in five bucks. Pastor P, if Sola Scriptura was valid, wouldn't it be prescribed in Scripture? Again, we kind of went over this um, 
this guy was arguing Sola Cristo from Face Palmer. And then we're at, almost at the end, guys, right here. Redfish Bear sent in $19.99, said nothing. Anna Cook sent in three bucks. Uh, says, what does Pastor P think of the icons in the church? We're not going to have time to get into that. Uh, NTP sent in a whopping $75 American Super Chat, which is $100 Canadian. Can anyone from the panel comment on the meaning of Barabbas from Aramaic? Can one give the root meaning of Jesus? Thank you, Jay. No, I, I don't. I'm not very good with languages and not certainly not Aramaic. No. OK. Can you, Pastor P? Well, I, I, I know about Barabbas a little bit, but uh, the name Jesus uh, is a is a comes from Hebrew and uh, it, it it's Yeshua. Uh, Messianic Jews call Jesus Yeshua Hamashiach, Jesus the Messiah, uh, and it, it's the name Joshua, God is salvation. Barabbas is an Aramaic name, and Barabbas was uh, a uh, criminal who was let go, uh, almost like a, the scapegoat. He was allowed yeah. to, to go, and G, almost like the scapegoat, Jesus took his punishment for him and 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 it was like a picture of us we were guilty and we were set to be <coughs> executed and jesus came and took our execution for us thank you i didn't so realize much you, for that. i didn't realize you said barabbas i'm sorry i thought you said the air uh, what's the meaning of the Arabic? yeah it, it was that meaning of barabbas and aramaic no well, but bar means yeah. bar means uh father I'm sorry, son, and Abbas means father. So, son of a father is what the what the actual meaning of Barabbas means. Okay, uh, is last last couple here. Uh, Jay, this from Kevin B for five bucks. Jay, what was the biggest factor in your decision to leave the Baptist faith? Um, so I ceased being a Baptist when I was um, eighteen or nineteen, and it was because I got <clears throat> heavily into Reformed theology. Um, so covenant theology, uh, uh, Randy Booth, Greg, Greg Bonson, um, Charles Hodge, John Murray, um, I basically got into all the, the reformed church fathers and <clears throat> I found their arguments for, um, infant baptism and covenant theology convincing, uh, I went to reform Bible college for a while and then I read, uh, these guys and then that took me out of, uh, Protestantism. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate it very much. And then just the last two here. One is from David Franco for 10 bucks. He says, no, I missed the debate. Thought it was scheduled for Downs seven my time. That's what you get for not looking into it. Cents. Uh, dang. Anyway, Jay, sorry. sorry Frankie he has been out of the game for a bit trying to get my stream labs set up again. Um, Mate Mateos Byzantine Respector sent in $10. Said, Jay, what is the best argument against total depravity? And will you debate Jeff Durbin? I think we reached out to Jeff Durbin like um, two years ago and this, there was a statement like, oh, he's booked out for uh, a year or so. I, I mean, we said, OK, can we get in get in the loop or the, the queue, the quay? Uh, so I, nothing ever came of that. But, uh, yeah, I would debate uh, Jeff Durbin. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the best argument against it. Well, you could argue that philosophically it's uh, Manichaean. I mean, if you look at Luther's book. Uh, bondage of the will i mean he's basically arguing that <clears throat> uh, human the human if you say the human will is essentially depraved then you're saying that a natural faculty that we possess namely the faculty of willing if it's inherently evil then god creates evil which would be manichaean um but theolog or biblically speaking i think i would argue that <clears throat> there's many places where we see synergy in the bible um, you know, Paul talks about synergy in terms of being a co-worker with Christ. Um, we believe that the will of man is never supplanted because he has a natural energy that's a faculty of his nature. So there's always going to be synergy. So total depravity is kind of wrapped up with um, the idea that uh, that there's monoenergism or monergism that, that God sort of supplants the human will in conversion. So I would go in the direction of, of arguing Christology and the, the text in the New Testament to talk about synergy and, and so forth. Okay, appreciate that. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to close the program up for the evening. Before we do, Jay Dyer, one more time, shout your channel out to everybody where they can find you play Resident Evil poorly. 
<laughs> well, I'm gonna pick a different resident you won't play it, play it better. <laughs> well, I'm I mean again, the first one's hard, I've never played it. So. Uh, the remake, my, the remake is tough, man. It's a tough I know game. that's what I'm saying. I never played the first one though. But uh <laughs> yeah, my channel's just my name, Jay Dyer, and then um you know, I host the fourth hour of Lord Voldemort. Uh, everybody can figure out who that is, uh, mostly every Friday. And then um, I have, uh, <clears throat> you know, social media on you know, Twitter and all that stuff just under my name. Thank you, Jay. We appreciate it. You can get out of here and know that. Uh, you. He's been uh, again, thank you, uh, Pastor P. And I, I hope I didn't get too, uh, nope. too. We got a little heated, but I apologize if I got a little no. overheated. No was, offense. <laughs> It no was offense. A, 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 a good exchange. I appreciate it. Well, Pastor P gets very excited himself when he's talking about the low. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I mean, <that's> <laughs> but appreciate it so much, Jay. Have yourself a wonderful evening. Thanks for sticking around, coming in sick and filling in. Pastor P, any words of wisdom you'd like to leave us with? And also tell your son that he's welcome to upload this to his channel. We don't care about content at the Crucible at all and never have. Okay, I will tell him that. Um, it was a pleasure to be here. And uh, don't, uh, I don't know, I believe that whenever the, the word of God is given, that there are those that are going to be uh, uh, put there to hear it. So uh, even though a lot of the attitudes seem to be negative towards me and what I said, I believe that there are people out there that are hungering for what I had to say and their lives will be changed. So thank you for the opportunity, Andrew. Of course. And we hope to see you back for future debates. I'm sure that there's lots of people who just can't wait to get a piece of Pastor P. <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, you were very respectful and you were very good natured. And I think that you won some fans. So we appreciate that very much. Have yourself a wonderful evening. Bless you, Andrew. Appreciate it. And then, uh, sorry, I'm uh, I am kicking you out of the studio. I don't I'm not, not doing it to be mean. I just um, I'm afraid that because of your age, you may not know how to remove oh. yourself. Oh. Tom. Tom, he said, feel free to upload and use use the show. So you don't have to ask permission. You have his permission already. OK. Yeah, it's already on my channel. OK. And. Uh, this is all the comments right over there on my channel. Okay. I fell asleep. Oh, yeah. I just woke up. Oh. Well, you know, you came on over here, and I couldn't hear what was going on, so I... Thankfully, uh, the question wasn't for me. Oh, that wasn't me. I oh. Wasn't, oh, yeah. Hold on. <laughs> I wasn't That's able right. to hear it. <laughs> That's right. Give me just a second. I, I, I didn't see that. So, um, they paid to ask you a question. I was thinking about it for a second. I was like, oh crap, I forgot to turn off my tip. So if somebody pays for a question, they're going, it's going to just read the question automatically. And I, as I was laying there, I was like, crap, I guess there's there's nothing I can do about it now. But So, yeah, so there, somebody did. Um, Thanks for the stream. Sorry to hear some cozy chatters were disrespectful, Pastor P. Nah. Don't bother me. Mm -hmm. All right. Watch stuff. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's wrong way. Oh, okay. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, I did not mean to fall asleep. Now I'm, now I'm still waking up.
uh, Joe Percy, and Jamic McCoy. Appreciate the subs, guys. Let's see. Why can't I super chat? Um, the it it should let you with the. You have to. We don't have the button. You have to go into the description. There's a. In the description, it it says like you can tip the show there. Now I'm wondering if I just keep the stream going or if, if I should, I should probably start the stream over. Um, so yeah, that's what I'll do. I'll take like, uh, I'm going to take like 10 minutes and then get, I'll take like 10 minutes and wake up for a minute and then I will. I'll be right back on, um, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about the debate at first, and then we got some other stuff to go over. So, I will see you guys back here in just a little bit. Make sure you go ahead and click the bell right now, uh, so that you get a notification when I go back live, and join the Discord so that you also get a notification there as soon as we go live. Or you can follow me on Twitter. I will also post it on there when I go live. So. All right, see y'all soon.